Hey, we're on. Welcome to the live stream for June 28th, 2017. My name is Dana Morningstar. And if you're new here, this is a live stream question and answer and support time that we all get together every single Wednesday for about two to three hours. So, um, if you have any questions for the live stream, you're welcome to email me directly at deardana at thriveafterabuse.com. And there's also information down below as far as, I have two different support groups. Both of them are free and um, one's on Facebook, one's on my website. You can find out more about those if you go to thriveafterabuse.com slash forum, F-O-R-U-M. And then you can also find me on Facebook by looking up Thrive After Abuse. But just kind of a word of advice or word of caution here. On Facebook, I have both a page and a group. So um, just be aware the page is open. Anybody can see what you're posting, whereas the group is closed. So I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, um, I think if you... If you scroll below into the description, there's more information that kind of explains the differences there. So lots of people are hopping on tonight. We have Shara and B Jupiter and Allie, Jennifer, Lauren, My Research, Gamer Christina. He we've got two Heathers. <laughs> and Lucy, hello. SG, Truth Seeker, Wise Tech, Jamie B., Lou, Mari, Mimi, T. Woods, Jean, lots of people hopping on. Welcome, welcome. So, hey, real quick, before I forget, we have a book club tomorrow night. We are going to be discussing the book In Sheep's Clothing by George Simon. That book club is going to be at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at, here on YouTube. And um, I think it'll be me and Lucy. Um, although Lucy, I did get a handful of emails from people that are interested in joining the book club, which is exciting and great. But I think because this month has been us kind of, well, me really, <laughs> like me trying to get in stride and get caught up with the books we've been reading. I'm kind of thinking it might be best to have, to get them up to speed for next month. And um, so everybody that emailed me that wants to be a part of the book club, uh, I will be emailing you guys back tomorrow and we'll, we will go from there. So thank you for your interest in it. Let's see. And Heather says, I just won in court against my ex. Yay. Yay you. Congratulations. Oh, I'm so glad. Easy plant-based living says, um, hi, Dana, thank you for all the videos you put out. Because of them, I was able to realize what was going on with my relationship. Since then, I was able to break out of all the BS um, and, and in being 10 days into it. Awesome, fantastic. Dragana's here. Welcome, Jennifer, Kevin. Hey, Kevin, what's the latest? Did you, what's the latest with your dentist? Are you getting that stuff done? I know that's been a intimidating thing for you there. Let's see, Diana is here, welcome. Lots of people, Elbaz, Heather, Elise, Katie. Mari says, I'm here from Norvegan's videos. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. Was it because of a comment? Wait, are you the gal? Did I leave a comment on his videos or her videos? I just commented to a couple people. I watch a lot of, um, oh, like, 
<laughs> randomness is really what it is on YouTube. And every now and again, I'll come across people that are, that are saying, I just got out of this really toxic relationship or this confusing relationship or this abusive relationship. And I'm, you know, I'm not doing well. And I'm always so torn as to whether or not it's going to seem like if I'm spamming their channel, if I say something like, Hey, I have a support group, but I, I'm to the point now where I just, I feel like, okay, I'm just going to let people know. And then if that channel wants to delete that comment, they can, it's I definitely not intended to be spam, but um, so yeah, you might see me commenting on other channels. I, I kind of, I watch a lot of like vegan videos and um, kind of, health and wellness kind of videos. Kevin, that's, wow, that's awesome. Okay, so you went every Wednesday is the plan for the dentist. That's good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Good for you. It's, I know how difficult that is to face those fears and, and do it anyhow. So good. Yay. <laughs> like, yay you. Okay, let me move this computer a little closer here. Uh, let's see. Heather says, oh, thanks everyone. I cannot believe the lies that he tried to pull in court. It was awful, but I'm so glad the judge saw through it. Yeah, we're glad to, we, I, I, you know, can only imagine how frustrating that must be to just sit there and listen to a bunch of nonsense. Uh, Lou says, Dana, could you talk about internalization of other people's projections or mention how to not internalize other people's perceptions of you? <clears throat> I think if you can get to the place where you're grounded enough in like who you are, like who you are authentically are kind of good, bad, and indifferent, then other people's perceptions are going to start to matter less and less. So, you know, how, kind of how you go about that, I guess realizing too that other people's stuff, especially the negative stuff, not just with narcissists, but with people in general, it tends to be like, it's their own, it's their own stuff. Like it's, a lot of the times it's not even anything to, to do with you or me or anybody else. It's just their own negativity and their own garbage that they're carrying around. And they just put that on other people. I think once you can realize you can kind of start sorting out like what's true and what's um, people's projections it, it, and it takes practice, but it can be a lot easier to, to just kind of let that stuff be that their stuff. Um, Bobby says, I'm four months out now and it's still so hard. Yeah. You know, Bobby, it's, it's hard for a while. And it's part of healing. Uh, you know, I always encourage people to join a handful of support groups. I think that helps tremendously in getting through all of this. And just, and I think too, realizing that the pain's not always going to be this intense, but it does, and it does tend to kind of settle down in time. Like you went through a, a major trauma. It doesn't matter how long the relationship was. Like even if it was just for a few weeks, the the emotional damage that a person like that can do is it's tremendous. And it it takes a while. It takes a while to move forward from that. Um, you know, I would encourage you, even though things are still really difficult and that you're you're having a hard time, I think to realize to make an effort to try to find something enjoyable every single day. And to tell yourself, I like to think of it as almost like physical therapy for our brain. Because when we go through a trauma, it's like our brain just grabs a hold of that and it doesn't want to do 
much of anything else other than focus on that trauma. And if we can realize this, that like it's kind of seized onto this trauma, but then part of, a big part of healing is kind of going through this like emotional physical therapy where we're trying to loosen the grip on that trauma and intentionally, and I think that's the key word there is intentionally go about finding, carving out some time where you're doing something that's fun or enjoyable, whether it's watching some stand up comedy, whether it's gardening, whether it's going for a walk, whether it's, you know, playing with your dog, if you have a dog, whether it's, um, playing video games, doing, doing something that's just enjoyable for you and telling yourself during that time, this is me reclaiming my life. And that may, may sound kind of strange, but it really does help to set that intention and then to, to really vocalize that to yourself and say, this is me reclaiming my life. This person, I'm not going to let this destroy my life. Even if your life feels destroyed right now, realizing I'm not going to let that happen. And practice shifting gears because trauma, like I was saying, it's the, it's like, the, it's like an engine, like the engine just seizes and it's not turning over. It's nothing's happening. If we can kind of help it to shift gears and start practicing other more positive emotions, like, okay, now I'm going to do something fun. Now I'm going to do something kind. Now I'm going to do something, um, you know, compassionate. Now I'm going to do something considerate and just getting your brain to start shifting gears again. It can really help to not make that trauma, like the core part of everything that you're thinking about, if that makes sense. And Lauren says, yes, it hurts every day. Yes. And, you know, kind of in a way, and this might sound really strange as well, that level of intense pain in many ways is a good sign because it's your brain's way of telling you this is not for you. This any any person, any situation, any event that causes this amount of pain, this is a signal for you to stay far, far away from it. Because your inner being, like your inner child, by whatever name you want to give that, knows that this is not for you, that you deserve something much, much better, something that's that's not painful like this, because love doesn't hurt. And I think if we can kind of reframe our understanding of the pain and realize that in many ways that pain is there to bring us the message of, uh, you know, to avoid that person and to avoid people that are like that person. And our, that pain is actually there to try to keep us safe. It's to make us, it's to remind us of that this is not for us. Like anybody that causes this kind of damage or emotional pain is somebody to be avoided. But yes, I, I think it helps too to realize many of your best days are still ahead of you. And, you know, it to keep moving forward and to realize that this, this pain's not gonna always be this intense even though I know it feels like it will be. Yes, Daenerys says, embrace your feelings, cry when you can, release those emotions. I also journal to purge my feelings. That helps tremendously. And getting that energy out, going to the gym, going for a run, uh, you know, going to a kickboxing class, journaling, crying. A lot of people struggle with feeling numb right after these relationships end. And they're like, I really feel like I need to cry, but I'm, I'm feeling stuck. I think too, I think a lot of men kind of feel that way because they're like, I, they just, I think men as a whole are really, you know, kind of not socially conditioned to cry. And many men struggle with being in tune with a kind of that wide range of emotions. 
So for, and for either male or female, it can really help if you're feeling numbed out to do something and like you want to cry, to do something that's gonna help to kind of provoke or like ease out that emotion. So sometimes watching a movie that you know is gonna make you cry like Titanic, something like that, where you can just cry and cry and cry uh, can, can be good to just bring that emotion to the surface and then just let it all out. A movie I had mentioned before, um, when I was a kid, my favorite movie that helped me cry often was a movie called Beaches. And it's about two best friends and kind of this, you know, whirlwind roller coaster ride that that they go through as friends. And it, it's a great movie. It's an old movie. It's from like the 80s, but a good a good movie to, to cry over if you're not in the mood for like, you know, a romantic movie like Titanic. Uh, speaking of movies, somebody had posted the other day uh, about uh, movies that helped for healing. And their two recommendations were uh, Sliding Doors, which is also another old movie with Gwyneth Paltrow and Groundhog's Day, <laughs> which I thought those, I thought those were both really great suggestions. So Sliding Doors, if you can find it, you can probably find it on like Netflix or, you know, somewhere on the internet. It's about a gal who ends up, it's, it's a really great premise of a film. So it, like she gets to this one point where she makes a different decision and I don't want to give it away, but she's in this, relationship with this guy and she gets to this kind of fork in the road where she's got to make a decision. And so the movie follows both paths. So if she were to have stayed the course and then if she were to have gone a different way, fantastic movie. I think it really speaks to uh, just the decisions that we make and that we can make now. So while it feels like our lives are blown apart, that sometimes when everything is falling apart, it's really kind of everything falling back together. That's a good movie. And I think Groundhog's Day just kind of speaks to doing the same thing over and over again. So, okay, let's see. Okay, um, so read asks, when the situation gets complicated and you feel guilty because you have actually had a lot of bad behavior, how do you know who is abusive or who is, or if it's only reactive abuse? Okay, it's a great question. So, and that's what can be so difficult. Hold on, I get this chair. Get comfortable here. That can, is something that can be so difficult with these situations because it becomes this loop of like abuse, reactive abuse, abuse, reactive abuse. And then it just becomes like this, this like snowball of dysfunction. Um, I think asking yourself, do I have this, have I ever had this dynamic with anybody else? I think that can be very, very telling. If it's you know, and if somebody else were there, like what would their, what would they perceive in this situation? Because it's, it can be very difficult being so emotionally invested and involved in the situation to actually see it clearly. But if you can, and narcissists do a really great job at just pushing a person's buttons until they actually explode. And so a lot of people, especially if they don't feel like they can leave one of these relationships or they're, they're kind of holding on to threads of hope that things can work. If they're feeling powerless over the situation, then they might start doing all kinds of things in order to try to kind of settle the score. So they might become reactively abusive. They might become, you know, name calling and even become physically abusive, uh, especially if the narcissist does not, you know, has a bunch of like squirrely behavior, you know, they're not giving direct answers. Um, you know, they're just like, 
and they keep having, like, especially cheating comes to mind. I see this a lot. So if the person's, you know, hiding their phone, they're coming home late, there's just, you know, they get caught texting other people and then they deny it or they play stupid or whatever. And it can bring out absolute rage in the other person to where they're punching holes in the walls or they're, you know, attacking their partner where they're cussing at them, they're yelling. Um, they might even get to the point where they're cheating on them. They're doing all of these things because it's like they don't want to leave, but they want this person, they just want this person to change. But because that person's not changing and then the other person feels like they can't really leave, then they're doing all of these kind of maladaptive ways of trying to make themselves okay with staying. It, and it becomes very, very problematic, the whole thing very quickly. So uh, journaling helps, I think, to examine your own, be your own behavior in this and think about, okay, well, what, what happened, you know, that I reacted this way and to kind of follow it back. So, and I think too, it's, it's a good sign. Like if you're finding yourself in a dynamic where you're like, I am, I feel like I'm a changed person. Like here I am, I'm lying, I'm cheating. I'm, I am, you know, um, becoming physically abusive. I'm yelling, I'm name calling. Like, this is not who I am. And this is where I'm at now in this relationship. Uh, or, you know, I feel like I'm a hundred years old or I'm sleeping all the time or I'm, or I'm not sleeping enough, or I'm, you know, I can't feel like I can't concentrate at work. I, I'm gaining weight or I'm losing a lot of weight or like this relationship is really having a negative impact on my life. Like these are all signs that this relationship is not healthy and this is not for you. So it's good to be aware of, of those signs. But having a lot of bad behavior and that uh, reactive abuse kind of stuff, that's, it's very, very common, you know. Uh, let's see, Still Prill, hello, says, hey, Dana, have you seen La Vienne Rose? I have not. I've never even heard of it. I'll have to check it out. Okay, let's see. And then, uh, let's see, where is it? Lauren says, Dana, I can't stop looking at the texts. I always forgive him. Okay, Lauren, and we, I highly recommend if you haven't already, do what's what I call, it's your for when you miss him list. And so this is a list that's just bullet points of things that he's done things why this relationship's not healthy for you. And it might be something like he lied about having a dog. He, you know, I, um, other women were texting him. Um, you know, he can't ever admit when he's wrong. He, um, you know, cheated on me that one time or what, whatever it is, put that out in bullet point format. So when you are finding yourself missing him or tempted to forgive him, you can pick up that list and you can read it and it'll, it'll, it'll shake you awake. It'll be like, Oh, right, right. It's really hard to keep that stuff in your mind because it's really easy to rationalize or deny problematic behavior when we want the relationship to work. So, um, yeah, keep your list handy. Some people have also recommended, and I, and I really like the suggestion of making, turning that list into like a video on your phone. So record yourself talking to yourself of why you don't want to go back. And when he does contact you again, to watch that video and remind yourself, like, this is painful. This will not work. This is going, you're going, it's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of your life you know, you wake up, like you've got to snap out of it and see this situation clearly. It's these people only ever bring hurt and heartache. Like this will not end well, like get very, very clear with yourself. So I know it's not easy. I know it's not easy, but 
you know, there are certain things that you can do and blocking him. If you can, you know, block his phone number, change your phone number if need be, change your Facebook account stuff or your email or set his emails up to go directly to spam or get a fake, fake book, a fake Facebook account that you use for a while and just give yourself a break because it's really hard to heal if you keep touching that wound. Lauren says, I have now lost my child from him. He keeps telling me to kill myself and I tried to. Yeah, so that psychological abuse and uh, it's that kind of stuff, it's, it's just pure poison, pure, pure poison. So, you know, I definitely would take suicide off the table, realize that you're dealing with a very sick and twisted individual that's just, that's evil. That's just flat out evil. If somebody's trying to push another person to suicide and, you know, if you're not already in a support group, I highly recommend joining a few and turning to people that have been there, done that for support in all of this, because a lot of people have gone through that. And that's just, it's devastating on so many different levels, but please realize it's not, it's not you. Like, it's not you, you know, he's a very just messed up person, you know, healthy, balanced people don't say things like that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you for bringing that up. Beryl says, uh, Lauren, a precedent was recently set as an abuser was found guilty of manslaughter for encouraging his ex to commit suicide, and she did. Courts are starting to recognize it. Yes, there was a uh, a case here in the U.S. recently. It was awful. I don't know if you guys heard about it. It was all on, uh, like, somehow recorded. I don't even, she must have recorded it. Or it was, no, it was text messages. I think that's what it was. They were able to get the text messages back and forth from this guy's phone, but it was his girlfriend and <clears throat> kept pushing him to commit suicide. And um, yeah, he, he did. He even at one point, you know, had said, well, I don't, I don't think I want to do this. And he'd had uh, the car running and um, was trying to, to end his life with uh, carbon monoxide. And <clears throat> she just kept pushing him. No, get back in the car. What are you, a quitter? Come on, you can do this. And yeah, she's now, I, I, I hope, in jail for life for that. So these people, it's not worth hurting yourself over. It's not worth, for sure, not worth ending your life over. Yeah, don't give up. Don't give up. Call, there's, you know, there's suicide hotlines out there. There's lots of different places out there when you're feeling that low. Um, Dragana says, I recommend this book to everyone. It's called Self Love. Effing love yourself. Raise yourself. Confidence by Laura Patton, P-A-T-T-E-N. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. Lauren, are you, are you away from this man? Um, I'm hoping that you're away from him. You know, I, I think keeping as much, keep a paper trail of any text messages, of any, uh, anything that he's saying that's like this. And at a minimum, ideally, please, you know, try your way, but he texts you 20 times a day. And you have a child together? 
if you have a child together, he's always nice, then he turns horrible. Yeah, that's kind of the pattern, that, that hot, cold, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of thing. Uh, you can talk to, you, oh, hey, you have three children with him. You can see, I would contact your attorney and see there are some uh, like third party places that um, he can only, he cannot contact you directly. He can, all communication needs to go through that, through that third party. So I, I would, yes, Beryl says, start recording with audio too. I agree. I would start recording this. I would start keeping text messages. I would talk to an attorney and let them know what's going on and see if you can get some sort of neutral third party that all communication needs to go. You need to have a witness to this, that a neutral third party needs to, to be in on this because his behavior is absolutely like outrageous and it's incredibly destructive and it's not something that you need to go through. Again, I, I would, oh, oh, you have no children with him? Oh, well, then I highly recommend going just no contact. Just go no contact. I know you're saying that, you know, you, you keep forgiving him. Write all this down in your for when you miss him list. I know it's so hard, ouch, so hard to reconcile when you're faced with that, that the Dr. Jekyll part is really nice and really kind and seems like a normal, reasonable, workable, you know, person. That's, pro that's probably the guy that you fell in love with. But the Mr. Hyde part you know, when a person flips on a dime and then they, 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 they go into that level of like awful abuse, it can be really difficult to kind of reconcile. What am I dealing with? Who am I dealing with? And it's that good side that keeps us going back, but it's, it's the bad side that you need to remember because abusive people are, are rarely a hundred percent awful, a hundred percent of the time, you know, even 1% of the time is a, isn't enough of a problem. Okay. But what you're going through is, is extreme. That's extreme. And that's not love. I also encourage people to, um, oh, Lauren. Yes. I, I so strongly encourage you to join some support groups. There's, uh, I may be under a fake account, I would, in your situation especially, I would encourage you to consider creating a fake account with a fake name like Jane Doe and put some pictures up there of like narcissistic abuse. Don't befriend anybody else that's friends on your other Facebook account. Go join some support groups on Facebook. There's one for specifically for uh, people, you know, um, that have children with narcissists. Uh, there's my support group. There's, um, there's another, there's just, there's many groups out there. So turning to these groups, and I think it, it's so, it's always so much easier, I think, to, to see our issues if we can see them in other people's stories. I think that's kind of the benefit of a support group. Like we might, you know, we might just be used to dealing with a certain level of abuse or craziness or, or what have you, but it's so much easier to see if you're reading the very similar things in somebody else's experience and reading the comments that they're getting. And it's like, oh, wow. Okay. Now this really is a problem and this is how they feel. And it's not just me and I'm not crazy and, and what have you. And yes, you're not, you know, the worst parent of all. And Lauren says, he says that I have paranoid schizophrenia and that I'm the issue. Oh, well, you know what? That's very common for them to say, oh, well, you know what? You're crazy. You're bipolar. Um, I've never heard paranoid schizophrenic, but I guess that would, I could see how they could throw that out there too. The bigger thing is asking yourself, do I feel paranoid and like, do I have these issues around other people or is it just this one person? Odds are it's just him. That's kind of that abusive person's mentality. 
you're too emotional, you're too sensitive, you're crazy, you're bipolar, and it's that grinding down. And it's not you. It's not you. It's not you. Even if you were paranoid schizophrenic, it still doesn't make his behavior okay. Like, you know? So, you know, the healthy part of you, the non- brainwashed part of you knows like this is really a problem. This guy runs really hot and cold. He's pushing you. Even if you were paranoid schizophrenic, even if you were any of the things that he'd called you any the fact that he's like, you should kill yourself. You, he's trying to push you into this, that it is never in a million years. Okay. So it, it's not you. It's not you. It's him. Yes, and oftentimes they're the paranoid one. They're the ones that run really hot and cold. They're the ones that don't see anything oftentimes wrong with their behavior. There is a great book out there too that if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's called The Verbally Abusive Relationship and it's by Patricia Evans. And in it, she goes through about 16 different types of verbal abuse. Um, I really like that book because it's helpful in that she talks about, it, I think it helps to clarify a lot of what we've experienced. So it helps to clarify like, oh, I never, I guess that's a problem. I just thought I was making too big of a deal out of things. You know, she talks about always, uh, you know, um, constant criticism, constant undermining, um, you know, cruel humor, uh, sarcasm, um, name calling, yelling, being intimidating, all of these things like this is verbal abuse. And again, it's so much easier, I think, to read, to read about this or to, to, to have somebody else, like to read it in a book and realize, okay, this person doesn't know me and they don't know my situation, and they're telling me that these things are a problem. It's a lot easier to connect the dots when you're not thinking like, oh, well, this person's just telling me this, or well, they don't really know the full story, or like you see it in black and white on a page. Let's see here. Lauren says, yeah, he doesn't think anything is his fault. It, right? That's the typical profile of an abusive person. They never do. And even if they do, it's never sincere. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. Like you're, you're just, you're, you got caught up with a, you know, with a pathological person and, you know, it's him. He's going to bring that to the table wherever he goes. Like it's his personality. It's not you. And my guess would be is if you were to talk to anybody else he's ever dated, you would find out that he treated them very much the same way. I'm sorry. Okay, let's see. Oh, I like that. Shara says, I really need to make my list of things I will not miss when I'm gone. I love that. Yeah, that could be an extra list that you could read. You know, like, I'm not going to miss getting yelled at. I'm not going to miss never, you know, I'm not going to miss being cheated on. I'm not going to miss being called names. I'm not going to miss feeling confused. I'm not going to miss feeling angry. I'm not going to miss being treated like dirt. I'm not going to trip. I'm not going to miss feeling like I'm living my life inside of a rock tumbler and that I never know when it's going to turn on. I am, I'm not going to miss, you know, all of their abusive rants. Lauren says, he told me if I ever slept with anyone else, he'd kill me. 
And that's very common for them to say those kinds of things too. And she says, I don't know if he's serious or not. I don't know. I, you know, I would err on the side of caution for sure, because a lot of times these obsessive, these people can be incredibly obsessive and it's all about winning for them. And, you know, sometimes it might just be, I'm always a big fan of, if you can, I'd recommend moving and just getting away a fresh start. You're not looking over your shoulder. You're not running into them around town. You can just change your number. Uh, you can just breathe. It really does make things a lot easier. I know it's inconvenient. I know it's not fair, but sometimes it's like, we just got to do what we got to do. Let's see here. Okay, this is, here's a question from Celeste who says, hi, Dana, I have a problem. I'm struggling with at work. My ex works there too, one floor up from me. He started working there about two weeks after we met. Um, after we broke up, about two and a half years later, he retired. Oh, let's see. The, okay. Um, the problem is he still works there from time to time, picking up casual shifts. I just heard he will now be working two days a week there. I try my best to avoid him, but sometimes end up running into him anyways. Every day that I go to work, I am a tense mess, wondering if he will be there or not. He is polite, but disdainful. I avoid conversation as much as possible. Every time I see him, it just breaks my heart all over again. My thoughts are ruminating on whether or not he will come back or not, even though I'm aware that he is sleeping around with other coworkers. I have to continually remind myself of the way he treated me in order to maintain some sanity. It is difficult to do no contact this way. I still think about him all the time because I'm worried about running into him. When I do run into him, he, push, he punishes me by looking at me as if I'm dirt and acting if I meant, as if I meant nothing to him, which maybe I didn't. I just want to feel better about myself and I can't move on mentally and emotionally if I'm always worried about running into him. I'm starting to think about dating again and I just can't motivate myself to actually do it as I'm terrified of being hurt again so badly. I have an opportunity to retire this year, but if I do, I will get less of a pension than if I wait three more years, which is what I want to do. Part of me wants to run away from the situation and part of me doesn't want to give him the satisfaction of leaving early. I've tried looking for other jobs in my sector for a long time to no avail. I'm not sure what to do. No contact doesn't seem to be working in this situation. Do you have any ideas? Okay. Um, yeah, I have a couple ideas. So, and a couple thoughts on this situation. A lot of people, myself included, struggle with being like, I don't want to leave because I don't want them to feel like they win. Or maybe I don't want to feel like they've somehow won. And so we continue to stay in a really toxic situation because we're trying to prove a point or because we just don't want them to win. Just out of sheer stubbornness, we're staying in a toxic environment. Here's one thing that I promised myself a long time ago, and I, I would just encourage you guys to do the same, is to make the commitment that you will never allow yourself to be treated like this again. Like period, end of story. Like it's not worth it. And it, it's, it's really, really not worth it. So there's that. <laughs> uh, I can understand wanting to stay a little bit longer to get more of a pension. So 
maybe look into, you know, wherever you work, is it, a, is it an opportunity? Do you have the option to buy years of service? A lot of places, like once you're vested for your pension, then you can, so maybe you're vested at 10 years, but at 20, you, you know, you get the, the full thing or, or what have you. But some places will be like, hey, if you stay for 10, once you're vested, you can buy however many years of service you want to buy. If that's an option, I would definitely look into that. And, and frankly, it can be a really good, you know, and good investment of money. Even if you don't necessarily have all that money, it might even be worth considering, you know, like finding another job that isn't stressful, possibly even doing doing whatever you need to do to buy those years of service. If you need to sell some stuff, if you need to downsize, if, um, you know, kind of what have you to make that happen. And then, so that might be an option. Uh, the other option might be, would be to talk to somebody at work maybe like in the HR department and just say, you know what? Um, like I was in an abusive relationship with this man. Um, it's traumatizing every time I see him here. I, you know, I really, something needs to happen. Like I, I need to do something different. I can't continue like to do this. I don't want to, obviously like talking to him is not going to solve anything you know, is there any way that you guys could like relocate me or you could change my hours or um, that some, some sort of like accommodation could be made? Possibly even asking them, them if they have any ideas as well. So that would be another thought. Um, taking a different way, if there's multiple stairwells at work, um, you know, seeing, you could talk to your boss, maybe you could work at home those days that he's gonna be there. That might be an option. Um, it's hard. It's really hard to kind of build up that emotional strength to be able to, to walk in to, to that two days a week. You know, um, it's just really, really tough. I mean, you, it can be done but I don't know if I would necessarily recommend it when you're already feeling so fragile and this is already so traumatizing. I think it kind of gets to the point where you have to ask yourself like, you know, what do I need to do for my mental health at this point? You know, and then move in that direction. It's just life's too short. Life's too short to, to deal, to, to try to heal from a relationship like this and then to continue seeing him at work is, it's just a lot. Okay, here's a question from Anne who says, my ex texted me after nine weeks and I, I did not respond. So yay you. She says, it said, if you're not busy, text or call. Two days later, I saw him at the gym and I left. He brought his girlfriend in there for a brief moment because she is not a member. She probably lives out of town. I question if this text was hoovering or a mistake. What do you think? Uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say. I'm a big fan of let's just err on the side of caution. Let's just assume that it was a potential hoover. And... Um, kind of respond accordingly. So I would encourage you to block his number, block him on Facebook, set up his emails to go to spam, realize it's just all a game. It's all a game to these people. And, you know, it's just, and try to try, I know it's difficult, but like try to just shut that door and be like, I don't want anything to do with this person. I'm, I am no contact. I'm staying no contact. I'm not going to let him knock me off balance because oftentimes those random texts out of the blue like that, I'm a big fan of any communication at all whatsoever from a narcissist is a potential Hoover. If they say hi, potential Hoover, it's all designed to get some sort of reaction out of you generally to reopen communication so that, that you can either be pulled back into that relationship or somehow pulled back into their pipeline. 
very common for Hoovers to come across as either kind of curiosity inducing like this one, you know, hey, if you're not busy, text or call. Like, oh, that's weird. I wonder what he wanted. Like, you know, and here you are, right? You're like, well, what is this? Is this a mistake? Is this a Hoover? Does he want me back? Does he, he's got a girlfriend, but you know what? Like all of that, it's designed to get your mind going to kind of plant those seeds of curiosity. So you do respond. Um, you know, Hoovers can also be kind of panic or fear inducing. Can you please call me? You know, uh, I just found out my dog has cancer or I just found out that I had cancer or that my, my brother has cancer. I don't know what to do. You're the only one I can talk to about these things or, Hey, happy 4th of July. Or, um, Hey, I think I left some, I left uh, some clothes over at your place. I can't find my favorite, my favorite shirt. I was thinking about coming by this weekend. You know, all of these things to really rattle a person into, into responding. So continue to stay no contact. If he shows up, you call the police. If, you know, block him, just no contact. We're done. Okay. Let's see. This is from Roses, who says, this is about um, what do you do if you have a child, an adult child, who you're concerned might be a narcissist? I'm concerned that my son is looking up to the wrong types of men to be a, a, for a role model. Um, how can a mom in this case prevent that from happening or even detect it if it is happening, especially if the young man is 21 and doesn't express himself? It's a lot more difficult when you've got an adult child, you know, because they're, they're adults and they're just kind of, you know, they're going to be kind of set in their ways and they're going to do what they're going to do. And frankly, I think most people kind of tend to have, it, it, I think it takes people a little while kind of until they get like their mid twenties to really kind of hit their stride with kind of who they are and what they want to be. And with, with having, I hate to say this, but almost kind of ha just having a good solid grasp on like their morals and their values and the kind of a direction that they're heading in life. If you're concerned about your son, you know, you could try talking to him. Um, it's hard if he's not if he's not big into communicating, I don't know your full situation. I don't know if he's living at home or if he's living on his own, you know, but if he's living at home and he's got a lot of problematic behavior that you're seeing, you know, it's okay for you to, to not be okay with having that in your house. So if he's living at home, you can very clearly dictate, you know, these are going to be house rules. Like we're going to treat each other with dignity and respect. We're going to, you know, no name calling, no, you know, kind of, you know, no, I don't want a bunch of women in and out of here. Um, if at all ever, like, I don't want women are not welcome to stay the night over here. Uh, you know, I expect you to have a job when you're here, these kinds of things, if he's living at home, like it's, it's your house. He's an adult. You get to make the rules. If he doesn't like it, he can move out. So, he's not going to like that, but it's the truth. So, you know, with younger children, a lot of people, actually, there was a gal in my support group who summed this up so perfectly. She said, you know, when you're, if you've got an ex that's a narcissist, you really don't co-parent with them. She said, you basically just do damage control. And I thought that that was really well said. One of the probably main ways to do damage control with that is to role model as much like appropriate behavior as you can. Because other people, kids especially pick up on stuff, even if they're 21, like they're still going to pick up on like how you handled certain things and what you said or didn't, you know, what you, yeah, what you said, what you didn't say. And, you know, that's, and it's difficult if you're struggling with like, he doesn't seem to have a lot of positive, healthy role models in his life
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot that you can, you know, necessarily do as far as, you know, cause, cause he is 21. You could always talk to him about your concerns and just say, I'm concerned with the path that you're headed down. Like I'm your mom. I love you. And this is what I'm seeing. And, you know, can we talk about this and, you know, and see what he says. But, you know, at the end, if he is in your house, end of the day, it's your house and, and you get to decide on what you're going to live with. So it's a question from Bear. Okay, Bear says, hey, Dana, uh, I have an idea for a video. It would be a video for the abuse targets, family, friends, or support network. Immediately after a grand finale, the survivor is traumatized and doesn't have the words or knowledge to explain what happened. Their family and friends want to help, but don't know what to do. It's a hell of a dilemma. With all the best intentions, they may offer up some horrific advice. Hey, cheer up, just get over it, can't be that bad, etc. I listened to the audiobook Healing from Hidden Abuse by Shannon Thomas. Towards the end of the book, she penned a letter to the survivor's friends and family. It introduced them to terms like gaslighting, intermittent reward, CPTSD, love bombing, and cognitive dissonance. It explained what will be helpful and what not to do. Importantly, it also offers them hope and a realistic sense of how much work lay ahead. Ah, where's the other part of this? I think you could make a video that would compassionately educate the people who desperately want their loved one to be happy and healthy again, especially immediately after the discard when all they see is a shell of a person they knew and they feel powerless to help. Thank you. I love that idea. I do have a video out there uh, on like how to help a person in an abusive relationship and the book that I'm still working on. So the book that I'm writing has, it's a series of definitions and there's quite a few of them. There's, I don't even know, like probably 40 or 50. And then there's also a section in there and all of the definitions have multiple examples. So people can see what this looks like in like a wide variety of situations. And then at the end of the, the book, it ha there is a section that's for family, for family, friends, or support givers on questions that they might have and um, kind of what they can expect and what not to say and why. So, but I like the idea of making that into a video. I was talking to somebody the other day about um, like taking different parts of my book or maybe even all of the book and making it into a series of videos. So, cause I, you know, different people absorb information in, in different ways. So that might be a project in the works here somewhat soon. Sorry, my back is, my back is killing me. I've been, out in the front yard for the past two days. <laughs> so if you see me like doing funny things with my neck and my back, that's why I'm just really stiff. Uh, let's see here. But yeah, great point. So thank you for bringing that up. I will um, definitely consider doing that. Okay. That's, these are all out of order. How did these get out of order? Okay, I think that's all. And then there's one in here that I'm just, I think I'd better answer that one privately. I'm not sure if she meant to put in that much information. So. Okay. Sabowen? says, I've addressed my childhood trauma so I can heal and be a more awesome version of me. I'm wondering if narcissists can heal by doing the same, if they seek help, or are they damaged beyond hope? The biggest challenge with anybody 
changing is that they have to actually not only acknowledge that they have a problem, they have to want to change and they have to want to change it on a very regular basis. Here's a good example. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. We went out for lunch and she summed this up perfectly. She used to teach English as a second language to adults. And we were talking about narcissism and personality stuff and very much the same question, like, could they possibly change? And we were talking about personality and I was trying to explain, you know, it's really difficult. So like you have, let's, let me back up a little bit. So like you have, let's say with alcoholism, the person needs to basically quit drinking, right? It's a, but it's a very concrete thing that they need to do. Like alcohol is the problem, quit drinking. They might be able to, to quit drinking, but it takes a person that's an alcoholic oftentimes a long time to realize that they do in fact have a problem and for that problem to cause them enough pain on a consistent basis that they realize that they fully stop drinking. When you're talking about personality stuff, it's not just one thing. It's not just, I need to stay away from alcohol, right? It's, it's in how they perceive the world. It's in how they relate to the world. It's in, it's just so interwoven into every single thing that they do. And so my friend said, oh, it's kind of like trying to teach an adult like, you know, like English or a different language when they're older. So when people are learning a language after a certain age, and I forget what age that is, there's actually a term for this. I think it's called the, the Kissinger effect, um, where a person, if you learn a language, like little children, when they learn a second language, if they learn it, I think it's before the age of eight, they can pick up that other language and speak fluently and not have any accent. If a person learns an, a language much older, when they're much older in life, especially if they're an adult, it's they're, they're going to have certain like issues with, with accents, or they're going to say certain words or certain sounds in their, like, they're not going to be able to pick up all of like the rhythm and tonality and language structure if they learn it later in life. And so they might have, you know, certain things that they say, I'm trying to think of something. Um, so for example, like a German speaker, right? They might say, they might pronounce their W's as V's. They might say like, oh, water, or I want, right? Like instead of I want or water, they might have, the, so their speech to a native English speaker is a little bit off. For them to correct that, to be able to say, I want or water and not say that with kind of that, you know, kind of that heavy accent in order for them to change that, even if it's brought to their attention time and time and time again, they're, they're going to have a really hard time speaking, like retraining their mouth muscles, their tongue, their brain, all of it to say those words, you know, um, I quote unquote correctly in English when they're much older. So it's, it's just kind of a weird way that the brain processes things. And so she was saying, she's like, that was one of her challenge with her students was to get them um, to kind of try to fix these certain like linguistic thing, you know, the linguistic glitches, I guess you could say, so that they weren't speaking with that, with that accent. But she said the only way that that would happen is if they experience enough pain each single time that they spoke that word, if they got teased for it in school or something happened to where they became painfully aware that this is a problem every single time, that would be their only hope of actually saying that word, saying certain words without that accent. And I thought that's very similar to personality disorder stuff. So even personality, not even forget disorder, just personality stuff in general. So if, if we have certain, you know, kind of things within our personality that are causing us pain, it's got to keep causing us consistent pain for us to work on it. 
And it's much harder for an adult to work on these things than it is a child because it's just more cemented into our way of, of being. So, you know, I also look at it from, from kind of my, my perspective, right? So like more on like the codependent side of the spectrum, how flipping difficult it is to, to set boundaries, to not be a people pleaser, to learn to say no, to, uh, you know, to not have all of this like inappropriate guilt where I feel bad, you know, saying no, or I feel bad asserting myself, changing. It's a truly a lifelong process because we're repatterning our behavior. And if you think about it from like the codependent side of the coin, our behavior causes us constant pain. It's, you know, we don't set a boundary. We're the one that gets hurt. We don't, we are a people pleaser. We give more than we can comfortably give. We're the one that gets hurt. We're the ones that are constantly, our lives are constantly not working because we're, we give too much. Narcissists take too much, but things work out for them because they take and take and take. But if they've got a bunch of people around them that give and give and give, they're not experiencing that pain. So that that awareness of this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem, isn't there for them. So it's going to be really difficult for them to ever see this is truly, in fact, a problem. You'll see with like a lot of narcissists, you know, if it comes down to something major, like divorce, you're going to lose your job. They can kind of get scared into like, oh, I'll do anything to make this work. Some of them, right? I'll do anything to make this work. They can, they might go to therapy for a few sessions. They might be on their best behavior for a while, but it's a pat, it's a pattern of behavior. It's their personality. And it, it, it takes decades to, to really, you know, undo that because you might, and this is what I, you know, I talk about this often of like, it's a lot like playing the game whack-a-mole where do you remember those games when we were kids? It was those machines at like Chuck E. Cheese or like those pizza places where you'd have one little mole pop up and you had this, this like whacker thing, right? And you would whack it when it would pop up. And then as soon as you got that one, another one would pop up and you'd have to whack that one. And then another one would pop up. It's like dealing with abusive, well, it's like dealing with problematic behavior, whether it's abusive or whether it's codependent. You know, a codependent person might tell themselves, okay, I'm not going to give my adult children any more money. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to give them money I can't afford to give them. And they might get better at doing that, but then they're going to struggle with poor boundaries in another area, or they're going to struggle with people pleasing at work, or it's because it's pulling a string on a sweater. It's, there's just, there's so much stuff there for us to like repattern and relearn into a healthy, more assertive, balanced way. It's the same thing with a narcissist. You might be like, this is why they really don't change because they don't experience this kind of pain on a regular basis. You know, they might go to all kinds of therapy and maybe, maybe, maybe get to the place where they aren't, you know, name like cussing, and name calling, but you might still be dealing with like, you might not be dealing with like that kind of verbal abuse, but you're probably still going to be dealing with like emotional and psychological and sexual and financial and spiritual or other types of verbal. So they might re replace the name calling with sarcasm or cruel humor or subtle put downs, or it's exhausting because it's, it's that mindset of power and control, and that doesn't go away easily. So wanting to change is one thing, but actually doing the work that's necessary to stay aware of our behavior and for them to stay aware of their behavior on a regular basis to the point where they are able to, you know, like undo all of the bad behavior and replace it with healthy behavior, that's quite the process. And I definitely wouldn't be sticking around to, to hope that an abusive, I call it turning a porcupine into a kitten. You know, I wouldn't stick around hoping that this porcupine can someday turn into a kitten. It's, you know, a lot of, there's better ways to spend, to spend time. 
Yeah. Dana says, my ex-husband says he wouldn't go to therapy because he didn't want to change anything about himself. Yeah. You know, and here's the other thing too, with a lot of narcissists, you know, if a person's, so like what you're talking about, so there's different stages of change. And the first like pre-stage, I guess is it's called pre-contemplation. It's where a person doesn't realize that they have a problem. So it's, if you're, again, like if you're to use the, the analogy of an addict or an alcoholic, you know, it's very common for a person to, to really minimize. I don't have a problem. Yeah. I have a few drinks every night. Big deal. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. I got a DUI, but you know what? The cops were just really out that night and I was targeted because I have a red sports car. It was, I don't have a drinking problem and they, they minimize it and they justify it. And then they tend to probably hang around with other people that are okay with how much they drink. So then it becomes kind of hidden. And then, so they don't see that they have a problem. They could be in court appointed, uh, you know, alcohol or drug addiction treatment and still be like, you know what? I don't belong here. I'm not like these other people. I mean, that guy over there, he's had two DUIs. I've only had one. I don't have a problem. Or, you know, that lady over there, like, you know, she's, she drinks, you know, um, twice as much as I do. So she's got a problem. I don't have a problem. It's this, it's the same thing with any problematic behavior. It's really hard for people, for any of us to, to take an honest searching inventory of ourselves, And that's one of, that's probably one of my favorite steps in any 12 step program is to really take an honest searching moral inventory of like your own behavior. It's really difficult to do because also how we think, <laughs> like how we think we act and how we think we come across and how we actually do tend to be two very different things. So, you know, change, I think if you can think about how much work is involved in changing behavior, it can help realize it's not as simple as, well, they just need to stop yelling. They just need to stop name calling. They just need to stop hitting. It's so much deeper than that. Like so, so, so much deeper than that. For us to to just think that it's, you just need to stop calling names or stop hitting. It's the equivalent of just telling an alcoholic, you just need to stop drinking or telling a person who's an emotional eater, who's 600 pounds, you just need to stop eating. Like, oh, okay. You know, I get, they probably had never, I mean, if, like, it's, it's just, it's not like, it's not that simple because every, everything that a person does is to meet some sort of need. And it, I mean, it just, it takes so much, so much work to undo that. Uh, let's see. Oh, SG, thank you so much. SG says, thank you for the live streams with a donation through the super chat. You are so very welcome. You are so very welcome. Elise, it, okay, says, what if they hit rock bottom? Would they go to therapy? Could they change? Here's the thing with therapy. Most people, not even narcissists, just put that aside. Most people in general the average number of therapy sessions a person attends is three, three. And because therapy is a process, it's expensive. It's once a week. And most people in order to really see any change, they would need to go for quite a while. So personally, I'm a, doing anything for one hour a week, I don't know how, how effective that's going to be kind of like physical therapy. If you only do, you know, if a person has a stroke and they go to physical therapy, that's one hour a week, it's probably not going to do a lot of good. You know, unfortunately kind of what insurance will reimburse is generally like that. Like, okay, you get one hour a week with a therapist or one hour a week with a physical therapist to really truly repattern somebody you're talking I mean, they would, I would say at a minimum, give them three to five years of weekly therapy and then see, 
that would be like the bare minimum to even see that needle move a little bit. But again, most people, you know, you've got to, you've got to pay for it. You've got to go somewhere for one hour a week. You eat kind of this wild card of, you know, is there going to be that rapport with the therapist? Like, is this the kind of the right therapist for this person? Um, you know, are they truly willing to, is the therapist going to be able to help them see their issues? I mean, there's, there's just, there's so many elements at play. Uh, I think a lot of partners or, you know, people, you know, partners of narcissists really want to think, okay, could this person with therapy, could they change? If, if you're dragging somebody to therapy, then they're not going to do the work. It's sort of like if you're having to drag a person to rehab, the odds of them sobering up is slim to none because they don't want to be there. So, you know, they can try, but odds are, here, and here's the other thing, any of us, okay, narcissist or not, nobody likes being told, hey, you're wrong, or hey, you've got these parts of your personality that are awful. <laughs> like nobody, anybody, anybody is going to get incredibly defensive at that, especially a narcissist. So if you, most people, when they walk into a, th a therapist's office, especially couples counseling, they're, they're on guard. They're feeling defensive because it's, it's your relationship. Now you've got this total stranger that's, that's in the room. If you've got this person that already has this mindset of like, I need to have power and control over other people. If they already think that they're superior and um, that they don't have any problem, then the whole time they're going to, they're just, they're going to feel attacked and they're going to be very defensive and they're going to think this is just a bunch. They're just not going to be open. They're just not going to be open to it. And it's, I mean, especially a narcissist, but I think a lot of people in general, it's really difficult to, to go to therapy on a regular basis, to find a therapist that you really connect with and to be willing to, it just, it just takes time to connect those dots. I mean, you know, I like to leave the door of possibility open, but I'm not going to wait around to see if another person's going to change. I, I think it's really important that we have deal breaker stuff, that line in the sand and realize, okay, this person they don't even think they have a problem. They think it's all my fault. Especially if you're if you're seeing if you're seeing a lot of behavior that's, you know, kind of these defense mechanisms like projection, blame, um, uh, you know, they're they're denying their behavior, the gaslighting, um, all of this stuff. If they can't even handle the truth of what they're doing, like they're a million miles away from actually being able to be accountable for it, let alone being willing to change it. So if they're denying all their stuff, I mean, you know, I just, it's, yeah, <laughs> like it's, it's a problem. Uh, let's see. My research says, I think I start to feel angry, but it isn't directed at any specific person. Has anyone felt undirected anger? And then she says, P.S. I'm on my period, <laughs> but I generally don't get angry on my periods. Well, then you are lucky because I become hateful when I am on mine. Uh, most people, so there's a wide variety of reasons people become angry or irritable. I mean, it could be low blood sugar. It could be, you know, hormone stuff going on. Um, you know, when there is just kind of like that generalized, I'm just irritated and, you know, just everybody just needs to steer clear or I just need to stay in bed kind of a thing. Very common. And it's it also, it's very common too, after 
trauma to feel angry. A lot of it's just kind of that residual stuff of what happened. It's, you know, toxic stuff is toxic. It's poisonous. And it, you know, especially if you're feeling isolated and not heard and, uh, you know, people are telling you all kinds of kind of that well-intended bad advice of, oh, you should be glad it's over or, um, you know, it wasn't that bad or it could have been worse or you really need to forgive or things that like you don't want to hear, like things that are not help, like intended to be helpful, but not helpful at all. Then yeah, then that can really make a person angry and, and irritable. And it might be too that <laughs> Dragana says that she cries a lot. She's, oh, she says she's a crying bitch from hell. <laughs> she's on her period. Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's important in our hormones as women, you know, they change. So, you know, and men too, frankly, like your hormones change. Like men tend that testosterone tends to drop off the older a guy gets. So, your hormones fluctuate throughout your life. And so maybe before you're like, you know what, five years ago, I didn't have this. Like I didn't experience these kinds of emotions. And now my body, like I'm now things are very different. And if it's that time of the month for me, maybe I am, you know, uh, like I cried. I, I, yeah. Crying during like puppy food commercials, right? Like you're just, you're very, you're crying a lot. You are irritable. Um, uh, you know, you might not have been that way before, but maybe you are now. It's, it, but the I think the important part is to realize to become aware of that. Like I, I become very irritable to a point of ridiculousness if I haven't eaten, and it took me like decades, really, like decades, to really, really realize that because it felt so out of the blue, and worse, it felt justified. Like I felt justified in my anger. Like I would go grocery shopping and there's people, you know, like, you know, I I'm hungry. So I'm in a hurry. And it's that feeling of, well, everybody's just in my way and, you know, they need to hurry up and, you know, God forbid somebody's sitting there writing a check, <laughs> like in the checkout aisle, you know, then I would just, and I didn't act out on it, but I would get huffy and, I would just, I mean, it took all I had to keep my cool because it felt reasonable. Like, yeah, I'm getting upset because that woman's writing a check. Like it feels reasonable, but it's not right. Or those people are walking really slow down this aisle. They like, pick your spaghetti sauce and drive on with your life. Like, what are you doing? Like you just get so angry and it seems so reasonable and justified, but it's not. That's the thing. Like if you can catch yourself and realize like, okay, <laughs> you know, people, this lady that's writing a check, she's not doing it to annoy you. These people that can't make up their mind about spaghetti sauce. They're not doing it to annoy you. Like they're living their life. It doesn't all revolve around you. Right. But it, it can, when we've got other stuff going on. So knowing that about yourself, that's also actually that extreme irritability like that's also uh, one of the signs for diabetes. So if you are experiencing that, you might want to get that checked. Hangry. Yes. Heather says hangry. It's when you're angry and hungry. Is it true? Oh my gosh. That's, I love that word hangry. Cause that's exactly what it is. <laughs> Dracana says justifiably hangry. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you know, to kind of pay attention to not only mood, but also like what foods are you craving? All of it. Here's the thing. All of this is about getting in tune with you, like the good parts of you, the bad parts of you, the indifferent parts of you and realizing, okay, this is what I need. So for example, I know that if I'm like, and it can, it can happen quickly. Like my blood sugar can drop and I can really become hangry quickly, you know, keep a snack in my purse to, if I'm going to go grocery shopping, uh, maybe I need to eat 
some crackers or something quick before, before I get there and not that today, that was exactly what happened today. I'm like, okay, I'm really, I don't have a lot of stuff here. I need to go shopping. Um, but I was like, I don't think I can make it through a whole trip through the grocery store without feeling like really hangry and, you know, had to stop and, and get some lunch. So it's just, it's knowing, it's knowing these things about yourself. Um, you know, how does it feel? How do you feel when you get depressed? How do you feel when you're stressed? How do you feel when you're sad? Everybody has kind of processes these different emotions differently. So for example, some people, when they get depressed, they might sleep a lot. Some people might eat a lot. Some people might lose a lot of weight. Some people might, might not have any problem with sleeping and eating, but then they realize, boy, you know, I haven't really made any effort to see anybody in like a long time. Or um, they just feel kind of like everything is gray. Like they don't feel really interested in anything. Or, you know, how, how do you process feelings of sadness? You know, do you cry a lot or do you get angry? Do you withdraw? Do you eat? Do you sleep? Do you, you know, we all kind of have these different tells about how we, how we process things. And it's so very, it's so worth paying attention to how do you handle, how do you handle these things when they come up? Like, what are your signs? So you can be aware of, oh, you know what? I'm doing that again. That's interesting. Uh, stress. A lot of people, you know, gravitate towards like high carb, high fat food. And, you know, are you, is there a correlation between like stress and things that you're eating? You know, the, the more you can kind of get to know yourself, the the I think the easier life becomes because you're, you're just seeing it. You're like, Oh boy. Okay. These are, these are some signs. Like I only tend to, to really crave glazed donuts when I'm stressed and I've been eating or ice cream. Like I've been eating those things a lot lately. Like maybe, maybe that's a sign that something's going on or, um, let's see. Yeah, Ben is saying, it was my experience with depression. I withdrew and didn't want to visit anyone. Yeah. Uh, Lauren says, does no contact help with anxiety and depression? Oh my goodness, yes. It's diff. okay, I will tell you though. It helps with the anxiety and depression. Like we were talking about earlier, it's hard for that wound to heal if you keep touching it. And so if you have contact with this person that's causing you pain, it's hard to heal from that if this person's still allowed access into your life to cause you pain. So that anxiety and depression will go away, but it might be replaced with some other uncomfortable emotions. This is why support groups can really help. And then preparing yourself for it because those, and here's a big part of this too. I'm a big fan. If you've heard me talk about meetup.com, it's a free website. A lot of the meetups are like low cost. Uh, there's tons of them out there, tons and tons and tons out there. They're worldwide. Oftentimes, if this person, if this abusive person has been a really large part of our life and especially if we've made much of our life about them. And then all of a sudden that relationship is done. Like we are closing that door. We're not opening it up again. Like it's done, done. There can feel like there's this big void in our life. Like, okay, well then now what? And it's really difficult. It can be very difficult to move on if there's that void there. So a, a way to go about that is to work on filling the void in a healthy, constructive way. 
So this is where these, these meetup groups can be so helpful. So if you're filling up that void, you're doing things that you love. You've joined like an outdoor adventure group, or you've joined a Chinese cooking class group or a French language group, or, you know, a chess club or, you know, movie night or trivia night within your joining. And I encourage people join like at least 12 different meetups. I know that might sound like a lot, but join, you can always say no. You don't have to go to anything you don't want to go to. To start filling up your time, start meeting other people. It's not dating. It's just getting out there, doing something, doing things that you're interested in, meeting other people. It, it really helps to kind of let your brain know that there's still life that's going on out there and that you can still be a part of all of that stuff that's going on out there. So it can be very kind of affirming and, and healing in its own way to just realize you're going to be okay. Like you're going to be okay. You can go out, you can make new friends, you can meet new people, you can kind of start building this support group out there. And I think too, the cool thing with Meetup is it's a bunch of people that are also in transition in their own, generally, like in their own life. Either they've just had a child, maybe they just lost a child, they just got married, they just got divorced, or now they're a widow or a widower. They're new to the area. It's generally people that are in transition. and Or they're super passionate about this one thing, whatever that one thing is. So it's, you know, it's, it can be worth checking out. But I would, I would definitely encourage you to, to plan for that feeling of, oh my goodness, like now what? Now that this abusive person's out of my life, like like what what do I do? And to kind of get a game plan together. It's very similar, I think, to quitting smoking or quitting drinking or or what have you, where you it really helps to go into it knowing, okay, I'm gonna have cravings. You know, right now I'm committed to like not smoking. I'm going to throw out my cigarettes and my lighter and my ashtray and I'm done. It's really hard to keep with that resolve when you're like, okay, I have my morning cup of coffee and now I want a cigarette or I have a a beer and I want a cigarette to prepare yourself. Okay. There's going to be triggers. There's going to be times where I really want to go run back to this habit that I had. And that's really what this abusive relationship in person was. It's like a, it's like a, a habit. And there's that pull, you know, that, that they, that these things have. So um, support groups can be good. Writing on that list, reminding yourself of the reasons that you're not doing it can be really good. Doing something positive instead. Zamika says, the 4th of July is coming up. I don't want to be alone again. I'm going to plan to get out of the house. Yeah, good for you. Good for you. And that might be, you know, a worthwhile thing, again, to go check out, go see if there's some meetup groups in your area. Oftentimes, people are doing stuff for 4th of July and New Year's Eve and, and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, Scott says, yeah, go see some fireworks. Yeah, Lauren says, I like all these positive ideas. Yeah, there's, Lauren, there's so much life out there waiting to be lived. And you know, I just, I, I know it's not easy to leave, but it's not easy to stay. And, you know, there many of your best days are still ahead of you for all of you guys. Please realize that like many of your best days are still ahead of you. And, you know, I think it helps to, to look at your life as it's a book. And there's chapters in that book. You know, you have the chapter of, 
high school. <laughs> you have the chapter of, you know, any sports that you might have played. You have the chapter of, you know, learning a musical instrument or learning a different language or traveling to somewhere or, um, you know, having a child or um, having, you know, more than one child or the bad perm that you got in 1985, right? All of these things are like different chapters in this book that is your life. And the cool thing is we are the author of that book. So if you don't like the chapter that you're in, you can decide, okay, I'm closing this chapter and I'm going to start a new one. And then you can decide what's going to be in this chapter. And then to start putting that into being. Yeah. Sabowin says, I've gotten past worrying about narcissists for the most part. I found the greatest healing and strength from working on myself. They have nothing to do with that. Yes. I love that. Good for you. Good for you. Dragana says, there's no meetups in my country, but I joined a D&D &D fantasy club and kill dragons all the time. That's awesome. Good for you. You know, and it's, it's like whatever you enjoy, whatever you enjoy. Uh, so let me scroll up here. <laughs> Truth Seeker says she's been craving funnel cake. Ah, oh, yeah, that stuff is delicious. Okay, scrolling, scrolling. Yes, okay, so Christian says, this is good advice because I used to go out to clubs when I was younger to get over a relationship and I'm just not into that anymore and the void would keep me a sitting duck for my narcissist. Yes, so there's this saying out there that the, and I do not get me wrong. I do not agree with this like at all. I and mean, this is terrible advice, but there's a kernel of truth in it, which we were just talking about. But the saying is the fastest way to get over somebody is to get under somebody new. Basically what you're saying, you go out to the club, you meet somebody and then, you know, you have this casual whatever with them that's not healthy, but like the healthy way to do that is to realize, okay, there's all of these, these emotions that this person's left behind this void. If you can fill up that bucket, if you can fill up that void with positive things, like new people, new experiences in like, you know, a healthy way, like you're learning French, you're going camping, you're, you know, like playing Dungeons and Dragons, you're, you're doing things you're not going to miss what you had so much. It's, it's so much harder when, um, you know, we have that void and we don't fill it up and it's understandable because a lot of times we're like, well, I don't, especially if there's an abusive relationship, it's like, well, I don't, I'm scared to meet new people. I'm scared to get back out there. What if I get hurt like this again? Um, I just want to be alone. Like that's very, very, very common, you know, and this is why I encourage people to not date. Like just don't date, like, just no pressure to do that. Just take that off the table for a while. Focus on, you know, m meeting friends and meeting people. And I will, cause I will tell you, It helps if you, I think, to kind of see if, because an abusive relationship, it's going to mess with a person's perspective 
on like what's, what's healthy, what's a problem. Like it just, it really kind of scrambles a person's radar of, of like what's appropriate. And so it's very common for people to get, to continue getting tangled up with like the wrong kinds of people because they're misreading a lot of signs out there. And so I think a, a healthier kind of safer way to go about this is to make friends and see, okay, what kind of friendships am I now having with kind of this new understanding with these new, this new set of like self-love and boundaries and this new understanding that I have for like what's problematic behavior. Now that I understand this stuff so much better, what kind of friendships am I making? And that'll kind of give you an, that'll kind of be a reflection as to like, you know, if you're still finding problematic people surfacing in your life and you, and you might, if you're finding them continuing to get in your life, even as friends and you're like, boy, this friendship is exhausting. This person's really draining. This is very controlling. This person is just too, too much. Um, then there's some signs. Okay. I need to like, why, like what's going on here? You know, how did this person kind of become a friend? And is this person in like my inner circle? That's another good question to ask and to continually, continually reevaluate, you know, whoever's in your inner circle really needs to be like a high quality person. They need to have good intentions. They need to have your good intentions towards you. They need to be treating you with dignity and respect. They need to be able, uh, you know, to be reliable and, respectful and, you know, just a solid person that's in your corner. And, and I'm not saying telling you everything that you need to hear all the time, but being able to have that open, honest, sincere solutions oriented communication that you guys can have very real conversations with each other and still be very like mindful of each other's feelings and all of that. And so it's a, it's just, it's a good idea to kind of reevaluate every so often who is in my inner circle and do they, do they still need to be in there? Because another thing that I, a, a lot of people go through is they'll have this inner circle, like, okay, these are my best friends from elementary school or high school or college or what have you. And it's just always been that way. And then they don't, like, and then the reality is like this person's actually a total jerk, but because they've known them for 30 years and they were their best friend in high school, there's this feeling of, well, yeah, that's my friend. And it's like, is this person really your friend? You know, is this how a friend would treat another person? Like, you know, so it's just, it's good to, to take a few steps back and evaluate that. Uh, El Boz, oh, that's so, oh, this is so true. Says, yes, I've been getting rid of toxic people myself and tend to second guess myself, as in, am I being too guarded or am I overreacting? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very common. I still do that. Uh, so it's just, it's part, it's part of it. You know, it's, I think it's good that you're, that you're getting rid of them. And I think it's good that you're being introspective and questioning, like, you know, am I being too, like, is this really a problem? Why is this a problem? Am I being too guarded? Kind of, you know, am I overreacting? It's, I think it's good that you question these things. The more you do this and the more healthy boundaries you have, the easier this will get to where you're like, you know, no, this is a problem and this is why this was a problem. So you get, you're able to like articulate this to yourself. And, you know, and you might find yourself kind of going back and wondering, cause you know, the good times can be good, but the bad times can be really bad. Might be thinking like, maybe I am overreacting. Like this person was pretty fun to go out to lunch with every now and again. So maybe I'm overreacting. 
but it's the same thing with the friendship as with an abusive relationship. It's writing out that list of like, this is why this person, like, I don't want this person in my life. You know, they continue, they give me the silent treatment periodically. They, uh, you know, like um, have all of these little subtle put downs. Um, I, I feel anxious around them. I feel like I'm walking on eggshells around them. I don't feel safe around this person. I feel like if I were to, I, oh, I don't feel like this person would be excited for me about anything, any of my successes. I feel like this person's always has this weird like competition thing with me. Um, you know, these are the reasons like this person's not a friend. Like, I'm not even sure if they're on this, we're on the same side. Like they seem to be, be kind of a jerk. And yeah, the good times can be good, but the good times, there's lots of good times with like lots of other people out there. It doesn't excuse the bad. Yeah, that's very true. Michael says, real friends do not hurt you on purpose. If that is ever the case, you need to let go. Yes, completely. I like that. That's well said. Yep. You know, and if they are hurting you and it's on purpose, or if they're pretending to just not know what they did, like it's a problem because then it's going to keep happening. Um, Anika says, I'm no longer with the, uh, abusive person because he had me so brainwashed to believe I was bad or cheating. Yeah. Very common. That's they. so many of them say that, you know, like it's the whole thing of it's the whole, like, look at what you made me do. That's the abusive person mentality, right? It's the, well, if you hadn't spilled your water, I wouldn't have had to yell at you. Or, you know, if you weren't, t you know, 10 minutes late, then I wouldn't have had to cuss you out. Or if you dressed sexier or not so sexy, I wouldn't have cheated. Or if you had, you know, you weren't home, like you were busy with, the kids or you were busy at work and that's why they always have an excuse and it's never their fault, never sincerely their fault. It's always everybody else's fault. And they justify it by blaming us. Like, well, I, you know, I cheated because, you know, like, I mean, there's, they come up with all kinds of things, right? I yelled at you because you spilled the water, you know, I'm getting upset with you because I can't trust. That's when it gets to a whole other level of like crazy. When they, when they start accusing you of stuff that they're doing, or they're just like paranoid, like, you know, they're, they're telling you that they're jealous because they care or that they're, um, but then they're accusing you of all of this stuff. And you're like, what are you talking about? Like they're saying, Oh, you had a Facebook account. And um, that means, you know, whoever, like, that you're cheating or that you uh, went out to lunch with coworkers. And so that means that you're cheating or you got home late and that you cut your hair. And that means that you're cheating. You, um, you know, like you can't even begin to be like reasonable or rational with that because it's unreasonable, irrational behavior. It's crazy making. Yeah, Suzanne says, well, they lied to you because they didn't want to hurt you. Yep. Yes, and that's a very good point. Um, Sarid says, healthy people can do this too, but then they say that they're sorry. So the difference is it's between like an event and a pattern. You know, so sometimes healthy people yell or maybe even, um, you know, get upset and cuss. The difference is generally like they're not going to be cussing at you, like calling another person. They're not going to be like berating or belittling another person. Right. But 
if they, if they cuss, if they yell, if they get upset, if, if they're doing any, even if they cheat, generally they're like, you, they'll own it and be like, you know what? I'm sorry. This is like, I don't even like, here's what was going on. I'm sorry. It was not okay. I realized I need to live a life of total transparency with you. And I, you know, let, can we let, let, let me work to make this okay. Like, let me work to repair the damage that's been done. Like a normal person, a normal person that cheats or does any of these kinds of things, they're going to be willing. They're going to realize, yeah, you're probably going to have a lot. Of, you're going to be angry. You're not going to trust me. You're going to have a lot of issues. You're going to want to know. You're going to want to probably hear the story of what happened like dozens of times. And like, and a normal person that's done any type of hurtful thing, that's, they're going to have to own all that. They're going to have to continue answering all those questions, proving, building up trust, um, you know, eating dirt. Like they're going to need to do what they need to do in order to kind of repair the damage done on that relationship. But, you know, abusive partners, you don't ever get that. Like it's, it's just all about, and it's a, it's a pattern. You know, they continue to do these kinds of things. And I'm frankly, I'm not even saying that you should consider staying with like a quote unquote normal person who has any of this bad behavior. If it's a deal breaker for you, it's a deal breaker. For me, cheating is a deal breaker. I don't care. Like, I don't care what happened. I don't care how sorry they are. I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because I know for me, I would become jealous, distrusting, resentful. I don't want to become that person. And because I like, there's nothing they could do. I mean, they could quit their job and stay home all day. They could, I could have access to their Facebook and their phone. You know, I could, they could be willing to live a life of total transparency. It still wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to me because it would, I would be done. Like done. Like, because I know myself well enough to be like, I would be, like it, it would change me for the worse if I were to stay and I wouldn't, you know, I, I can't do that. And that's the same thing with, with people yelling or cussing. Like I just, I wouldn't stay. You know, or even silent treatment. I dated, I went out, I uh, was going kind of seeing this one guy for a few months. This was a while ago. And he, there were signs, like the signs are starting to come out and it was silent treatment um, for a few days. And I told him, I said, I don't do silent treatment. So if you've got an issue, we can talk about it. But if we're not going to talk about it, then like it's over because I don't, I don't do that. Uh, Evie says, do you feel phone affairs, texting, calling, or cheating? Yes, I do. Cheating is any type of like hidden emotional affair. Like it doesn't have to just, it's the thing with cheating is it's not just penetration. It's not just the physical act of like sharing your body with somebody else. It's, it's trust, it's dignity, it's respect, it's, um, you know, honesty, it's all of that emotional stuff that's destroyed when that's there. If a person's, if a person wouldn't act that way in front of you, and a lot of cheaters will say this, whoa, it was just emotional, or I was just bored at work, or I was, nah, 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 what have you, you know, this means nothing to me, basically, right? She means nothing to me, or this online stuff is just for fun. Then my question would be then, well, obviously our relationship means even less because if you're willing to destroy our relationship over something, somebody or something that means nothing to you, then that sure doesn't speak very highly of, of how you view our relationship. So, um, yeah. And if a person's acting, if they're hiding what they're doing, they're, they're hiding it because they know what they're doing is wrong. So I don't buy in a million years that they're saying, oh, it's emotional. It's nothing ever happened. No, and frankly, everything happened. 
everything short of like penetration happened. And it's all of that stuff. It's the broken trust, the lying, the manipulation, the deceiving, the hiding, the, you know, um, all of that. That's, that's the hard part to repair. That's where the bomb goes off. Whether or not there's any, you know, physical contact or not is, is secondary. And frankly, I say the vast majority of time when somebody says that they were, that they were, it was all emotional, it was all online, they're, that they're lying. I mean, most people aren't going to get themselves all worked up and hot and bothered and then not act on it. So if they aren't already having a physical affair, they're going to. Like it's going, and if it's not with that person, it's going to be with somebody else. It's really opening Pandora's box when somebody starts, you know, chatting and flirting and being inappropriate. Like you can't, it's really hard to close that door once you've opened it. Because it's the thrill of somebody new and it's the thrill of, you know, kind of sneaking around and, and it's just, it's all of it. Wow. So Bowen says, my ex-domestic partner had an emotional affair. He and our therapist, wait. He and our therapist told me that if I didn't get over it, he would cheat again. That would be my fault as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, hopefully your therapist saw that as the manipulative nonsense that that is. That's such a narcissist thing to say too. Like you're living in the past. You can't trust me. It's like, that was a month ago or like that was a year ago. You, you were cheating on me. I'm not going to just instantly be okay with it. And, but a narcissist doesn't understand that in their mind. They're like, okay, I'm tired of dealing with this. Like that was, I'm over it. So you should be over it too. And if you don't get over it, then I really am going to cheat because you pushed me to it right there. Like, no, 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 no. Nope. Done. Deal breaker stuff. Yeah, Zamika says, I'm 40 years old and I'm just now discovering my deal breakers and my boundaries. So you can imagine my relationship life. I'm so glad that I'm healing. Yes, I hear ya. I hear ya. Me too. I'll be 40 next month and it's the same. Like just within the past year, discovering deal breakers and boundaries and realizing that I didn't, I just didn't have good boundaries. I, I always thought that I did. That was kind of the strange thing. Real, it's the realization. I mean, that's just life, right? Like we go through life and we're like, man, that's really wild. <laughs> like I didn't realize that I was doing that or I didn't realize that I had a problem in that area. And then it gets brought to your attention. You're like, wow, that's a game changer, you know? And it's it, very eye-opening when you start examining deal breaker stuff. And especially when you get to the point where you're like, okay, you know what? No more excusing bad behavior. There's, you know, I like to think of deal breaker stuff as, you know, any act ab abuse of any kind, whether it's verbal, emotional, psychological, physical, sexual, financial, spiritual, any form of abuse, deal breaker, done. Next, like not playing those games at all because it's a sign of what's to come. So abuse is a deal breaker. Active addictions are a deal breaker. If you're talking alcoholism, you know, drug addiction, gambling, you know, spending, um, you know, what eating disorders, like any type of addiction that a person's actively wrapped up in. And the reason being, it's not because they're, not, they're, they're a bad person, but when a person has an active addiction, first of all, you don't really know who they are because you're, you're dealing with this, the addiction. And that addiction, if they don't get that treated, then it can consume them and it can, it can sink them and it can pull you in with them. So abuse is an, as an I'm out a deal breaker, Ad active addictions, I'm out, abuse addiction, adultery, 
So cheating of any kind, done, deal breaker, abuse, addiction, adultery, and attitude. So if they have a really like a persistently negative attitude, if they're always kind of telling you why something won't work, if they're kind of raining on your parade, if they are just dragging you down at all on a consistent basis, like nobody, who needs that, you know? So those, those are kind of my, my top deal breaker things that I've realized, like it just, it's not workable. And, um, you know, having those boundaries and realizing, okay, you know, it's not unreasonable to think that I should be treated with, you know, open, honest, sincere communication. Like that's not a whole lot, a lot to ask. And to be treated with dignity and respect. Like that's not a lot to ask. That's like kind of the basis of getting along with other people. Richard says last week on the third date, this gal that he was on the date with brought up having an open relationship, paid my share. Oh, then he paid, paid his share, excused himself. (laughs) He says, no way. I'm better than that. Got up and left. Good for you. Yeah. It's so key to know what you're looking for and like what you're, what you're like, what's workable and what's a deal breaker. And And Sunny says, yep, no more helping someone fix their life. Yes, I agree. I think it's completely reasonable and appropriate to be like, you know what, this is kind of where I'm at in my life. And, you know, I want somebody that's got this stuff figured out. Like that's kind of, you know, emotionally stable, that they know how to Mm -hmm. communicate, that they, um, you know, like, they don't need rescuing that I can actually, I can have a partner. I'm not looking for a project. It's kind of the way to put it. That's a very great point. Bob says, personally, I've progressed a lot by not being around people as codependents. We need to learn how to be happy alone. I have found that now I don't need people to be happy. Yes. I love that. Yeah. That's huge. That's huge. You know, it's when you realize that you can be totally fulfilled and there's a difference between being alone and being lonely. I think a lot of codependent people feel very lonely and because if we're continually looking to other people for love and affection and, Um, guidance or to be kind of taken care of to realize that we can give all that to ourselves. You know, we can find enjoyment in, you know, like gardening or going for a walk or getting, you know, immersing ourselves in hobbies or spending time kind of doing whatever, like we can build a healthy life. We can build a very fulfilling life to where other people that come into our life, you know, they, they're like the candles on the cake. They're not the whole cake. And if we can get to that place where we're like, man, I, you know, I really, it's not, it's nice. Like I really enjoy my time alone. Like I don't feel lonely. I can entertain myself. Like I, I, there's things I like to watch on YouTube. I like to write. I like to journal. I like to make jewelry. You know, um, I like to cook. I like to, organize. I like to, you know, they're just like, you just can live a very fulfilling life and not, not need other people like that. Kevin says, yeah, and to be able to stand up for myself and have self-respect. 
Yep. That's huge. That's huge. And let me add to Kevin, like advocating for yourself, you know, like what you're doing like with the dentist being like, okay, I'm terrified of dentists, but I know I need to go. And so here's the game plan. Here's how I'm going to do this. Like that's part of self-care. That's part of self-love. Being like I need to do this for myself. And so this is how I'm going to go about it. Lauren says, Dana, people are mean to me because I'm shy and it hurts me. Do you have any tips? Oh, that's so, that can be so tough. I can, I can only imagine. Um, I think for starters, realizing that if anybody's mean to you about something like that, especially about being shy, that they're jerks <laughs> and that there's nothing wrong with you, that there's a lot that's wrong with them. And, you know, different people, there's lots of people out there that are very introverted. And, you know, if that's just your personality, then that's okay. I think if anything, it's a sign to find people that are more along the lines of like your people, because there's nothing wrong with you you know, so what, so what you're, so what you're shy, you know, there's nothing wrong with being shy. It's just right up there. Like, okay, a person's tall or short or has blonde hair, or it's not everything about you. Like it's one thing about your personality and there's nothing wrong with it. It just, it is like you are shy. You know, if it's something that you want to work on, um, you know, then that can be something to work on. Cause I could imagine that that would be, you know, that could be very, very difficult to be, to be that shy all the time. But again, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to work on it cause there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with it. But if it's something that bothers you, then that would be a different conversation that we could have. I would just encourage you to, to love yourself the way that you are and to find people that treat you with dignity and respect for who you are. Yeah. Benabazi says, yes, shyness is often a sign of introversion and that feeling things deeply, there's nothing unusual. That, and that's a very great point. Trisha says, with shyness, what can help is to take the focus off yourself and be interested and ask questions about others. I love that. That's so, so true. There's a, another channel on YouTube that I really, really enjoy. Uh, for anybody that is struggling, um, you know, with being shy or, uh, or if you're even just interested in charisma in general, in being like more extroverted, uh, there's a channel called Charisma on Command. It's really, he's just really an interesting guy and his channel is fantastic. And he talks a lot about like body language and kind of, um, you know, kind of what makes certain celebrities charismatic. And it's a kind of a breakdown of human behavior. Very, very interesting channel. It's just very good. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, the benefit too, there's a lot of benefit to people that are shy or that are more quiet. And like Trisha was saying is, you know, most people like to talk about themselves narcissist or not, most of us like to talk about what's going on with us. And 
you know, if you, if you are finding yourself in an uncomfortable situation to just keep asking them questions and let them do all the talking. And frankly, they'll probably leave (laughs) that conversation thinking that you were so incredibly interesting. And the reality is you just let them do all the talking. Uh, Banaz B says, what is charisma anyway? It's so confusing. I don't quite understand it. So charisma kind of almost has a negative connotation to it, I think, a lot of times. Somebody who's really charismatic. Well, so like in the cha- in the channel that I'm talking about, Charisma on Command, somebody who's very likable, who has a very good like stage presence, who, uh, so like he uses, for example, like Will Smith or Ellen DeGeneres or um, who Robert Downey Jr. Uh, I think probably Will Smith would be the best example that I could think of of charismatic. You know, somebody who's funny, who's entertaining, who, you know, just really likable. Like, you know, he walks into a room, everybody, he just, he's easy to be around is really what it is. Trisha also recommended the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I think I agree completely. That's a fantastic book about kind of just interpersonal relations, relationships with people. Highly, if you guys haven't read that book, I highly, highly recommend it. It, it sounds manipulative and I guess in some ways it kind of is, but the the behaviors that he talks about, it's it's just kind of this breakdown, like this this character breakdown, this personality breakdown of these are the things that make a person likable. And um, you know, it he just it's a it's a fantastic book. Highly recommend that too. You might even be able to find that on YouTube. Oh, let's see. Let me scroll up. Ah, this chat. There, Scott, thank you so much. Gave a donation through Super Chat. Says, Dana, thank you so much for what you do. We are all on our way to healing. Yay us. Yes, yay us. I agree. Thank you. Thank you for that. And... Maria says the author, Gavin De Becker, defines charm as being put on. Someone is charming you versus being charming. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, if a person's, to me, charming is never a positive thing. Like there's always that level of like, oh, brother. <laughs> Just kind of that, that, like they're laying it on too thick. I was actually, okay. I was watching a movie the other day and um, movie, I had never seen it before, Meet Joe Black. And at the beginning, well, I mean, at the beginning of the movie, there's a scene in there. If you look, if you were to go on YouTube and look up like the coffee shop scene in Meet Joe Black, there it's like a five minute snippet. That would be charm, charming. And so it's interesting because I think one of the things that's so problematic is that level of superficial charm is portrayed as romantic. And so I'm watching this and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like this guy's laying it on so thick and he's just trying, making such an effort. It's just ridiculous. It's a bunch of dreck. But it, if you don't know better, you're like, oh, that's, you know, This man is just so wonderful, but no, like that's when they talk about kind of sociopaths and narcissists being superficially charming, that's what they're talking about. It's telling a person everything that they would want to hear. You know, uh, I've never met anybody like you. Oh, you're so mature for your age. Or, uh, you know, you're so interesting. Or, you know, I was just really intimidated by your beauty or... Uh, you know, I'm just a, a one woman kind of man. I'm trying to think of different things that he said in that scene. I'm a one woman kind of man. And, you know, I just, I really believe in taking care of a woman. And he's just, he's basically like anything that a, 
like a woman kind of that fairy tale that a woman would ever want to hear. He tells her within the first like five minutes of that movie. Gosh, I tell you, uh, Oh, I see. I should really start a whole video series. There's okay. So there's another channel that I watch periodically. It's called uh, Cinema Sins on YouTube, and they do this analysis, this breakdown of everything that's wrong with different movies. It's really entertaining, and so they'll point out different flaws. They're like, okay, they're on the spaceship, but yet they're breathing without oxygen. But yet, in you know, and they kind of count up all of these different errors in, in this film and it's, it's an, it's a good, it's a good show. It's a good channel. And uh, so I was thinking, man, I should really do like a series of like, like issues that I have with different movies because there's, I don't know. I watch them and I'm like, man, this is ridiculous. Uh, Missouri Cowboy says, thank you for letting us be here, even when we just hug our cats. Oh, you are so welcome. I'm so glad that you guys show up and I'm so glad that we can have this time every week. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mantis says, only a small percentage of people find ugly people charming. Be honest. I don't know if I agree with that, to be honest. I think it's it's so much personality. Personality, I think, makes or breaks a person. And um, Gene Wilder, I, you know, he has passed away. I had the biggest crush on him for years. I thought he would, he was like my ideal man. Like I just, I just loved him. Like I, he, I thought he was incredibly, it was his personality though. But if you were to look at him, you wouldn't think that's a handsome man, but his personality, he was just, he was charismatic and funny. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I think personality just makes or breaks a person. And I've seen, you know, obviously other men that are by more you know, normal standards, like, oh, that person's more like stereotypically attractive, but then their personality is just awful. And it's like, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't want to date that. I wouldn't want to be alone with that person like for any length of time. <laughs> Manta says, uh, one would have to be as charming and as beautiful. Oh, <laughs> he says, P.S. Gene Wilder is hot. Hashtag straight guy talk. Yeah, he was awesome. He was awesome. I miss, I miss him. Dudley Moore. Yeah, he was charming. Um, yeah, there's lots. Um, Rick Moranis. You know, he was, he was charming. Uh, yeah, there's lots, lots of. Uh, yeah, New Beginning says, I'm attracted to personality before looks. That's just me, though. I am the exact same way. And you know what's weird? I didn't realize, like, I, 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 it, it took me a while to realize that that's what that was. So when people began like in junior high and high school, maybe the junior high, people began putting posters up of like different like boy bands. I'm sure guys had the same thing, right? Like you're putting pictures up of, or posters up of, of different girls or what have you. I, okay. And all I did have a poster of Corey Feldman and maybe one of Corey Haim. But outside of that, um, I really, it was the same. I'm like, it's personality. Like it was never like, oh, just that guy is hot. So like those calendars with like, you know, beefcake firefighters on them, like that does, that seriously does nothing for me. I, nothing. Like 
Chippendales, nothing for me. It's all personality. Makes or breaks a guy completely. So I, I hear you on that. Oh, let's see. Heather says, thank you for your free support group. I have learned so much from you. You rock. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And thank you for the donation. Yeah, the support group uh, is awesome. And uh, I'm not just saying that because it's my group. I'm saying it because it's full of the Facebook group, we now have close to 45,000 people on there, if you can believe that. And then the website group, I think is right around 4,000. So it's, it's just awesome. Like the amount of people that are in there that have gone through very similar things that are supporting one another, that, that are there 24 hours a day, because it's people from all over the world. Uh, it's just phenomenal. The internet is just such a cool thing. Missouri Cowboy says, uh, Ross Rosenberg claims in his book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, that when I heal, I will be attracted to a whole healthy person. I think there's a lot of truth to that. But I think that healing, you know, a big part of healing, it's, it's, it's so much more than not feeling devastated by what happened. Um, it's like, I think true healing, it's really, it's getting in tune with your emotions. It's having deal breaker behavior. It's knowing what your deal breakers are. It's knowing what problematic behavior is. It's being okay to walk away from something without waiting until things get, without waiting for them to prove you right. It, it's, it's, um, you know, having boundaries, being able to be assertive. It's, uh, and, and these things, they take time and they take practice. And we don't have to be like this perfectly actualized person, you know, in order to like attract perfectly actualized people. But if we're going in that tra trajectory, that's when our life really starts working. And frankly, a, a big part of that is, learning what's problematic behavior and then being a, being okay with walking away from something when it starts to, if it starts to take a turn and we're like, mm, this is going into those areas of that, you know, that abuse, addiction, adultery, or kind of problematic attitude. Like if it starts kind of like veering into that territory being like, you know what, this isn't working for me anymore. Like I'm not going to try to justify this or deny it or rationalize it. Like, I'm just going to either bring it up and see if they are willing to change right away, or I'm going to just leave. Like not going to be dragged through hell. Once we start getting that stuff into place. Yeah. Then we are because so like I was talking about in that scene from meet Joe black where, you know, here's Brad Pitt and he's just laying it on so thick to this. I forget her name. Her name in the movie is Susan. Susan, you know, he's just telling her, oh, I just want to take care of a woman and I just want to be there for you. And I just, you know, like telling a woman everything that she would ever, that most women would want to hear. And she's just taken in by this. And all I could think of is if some guy that I don't know starts telling me, hinting at being married to me and telling me how much he likes me and he's coming on so strong right out of the gate, that's not a turn on. That's like, I need to turn around and run. And I think the healthier we get, the more we see that kind of like covert problematic behavior for what it is. And it stops being romantic. So a lot of like the narcissist behavior of they're coming on so strong. It's a whirlwind. They want to hop into bed right away. They want to text on the phone 20 times a day. They want to very quick to make you their whole world or we're very quick to try to make them our whole world, right? And so that's how that, that whirlwind really picks up steam. When we realize that's problematic and we can and not see that as romantic, it's not romantic, it's problematic. If we can start slowing things down and be like, okay, 
this is going to happen on my terms at my pace because it's my life. So, you know, this other person, you know, they, they want to go out for dinner and then a movie. And instead of saying, yes, we might say, you know what, let's maybe just meet for coffee instead. Like you're slowing down that. If they're telling you, oh, you're so perfect for me. I've never met anybody like you. They're laying it on so thick. We're not, getting sucked in by that. We're like, that's a red flag, you know, healthy, well-adjusted adults don't talk like that and they don't move like that. So yeah. And here's the other thing too, is when we can see kind of like that game, like that, that game, I guess, like that superficial charm in motion, as problematic, then a lot of like people that are more normal, like when you come across somebody that does kind of catch your eye or does have that, you know, they're intelligent or they're funny and things are moving slower, like at a comfortable pace, that's going to become a lot more attractive to you. So it might not be attractive now, but it might be in the future. Cause you're like, boy, this is so nice. And then eventually you'll get to the place where like, it is so nice to not have to walk on eggshells and not have to worry and not feel, feel suspicious or um, to be abused, to be yelled at or called names or given silent treatment or any of that. Like it's nice to, to just come home. Just, it's nice to have peace in my life. That's the goal. Like just having peace. And kind of like once that connection is there with friends, with coworkers, with a significant other, it's like, you just wouldn't trade that. This chat's going fast here. Uh, Was it Lou? Lou had mentioned something about the, the taking care of a woman. And he said, I'd always thought that, that he wanted to do that, but now he's kind of wondering if that's codependent. I think it's kind of whatever two people, whatever their dynamic is in that relationship. But so, and I guess it depends on like how you mean taking care of, if you're talking, I don't know. I get, I I think maybe the, it's nice to, to be with somebody who doesn't need you to take care of them, who doesn't need you. That's where it gets into problem territory. If they need you to support them financially, that's a problem. If they need you to support them emotionally all the time, like they don't have anybody else, it's all you, then that's a problem. If you're finding that you're having to like sink yourself either financially or emotionally or physically or what have you to help them swim, that's a problem. That shows that that dynamic is out of alignment and something kind of needs to to change. Uh, Missouri Cowboy says, tell us how to get to the book club tomorrow, please. And tips his hat to the pretty lady. (laughs) He says, howdy, howdy, Miss Lucy. Okay, so book club. Tomorrow, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It'll be here on YouTube. And the book is In Sheep's Clothing by George Simon. And uh, I am not sure. It might just be me and Lucy again next week, like on Zoom. But then, because I need, I'm going to have to figure out how how to get other people on. And then we're going to have to do like a, maybe like a kind of a dry run of that before we go live. 
So that might have to wait until like the next month. So we can make sure everybody that wants to join the book club has read the book and, you know, uh, kind of what have you. So I'll talk to Lucy about it tomorrow, but I think for, for now, let's just plan on meeting, like meeting back here at six 30 tomorrow night, Eastern standard time. And uh, let's see, uh, the email address is my email is uh, dear Dana at thriveafterabuse.com. And so you can just put in the subject line book club. And so for people that want to be in the book club, the, the deal is that ideally you would read the book ahead of time. And then Lucy, ideally Lucy and I, so it's not all on Lucy. Uh, maybe you guys too down the road be coming up with some questions and then we'll compile the questions. Everybody will have, get it like emailed a list of questions out to them ahead of time. And then we'll discuss those questions through like a Zoom group chat kind of a thing. So yeah, I think for sure, there's going to be quite a few more people on for the book club chat next month. But you guys are more than welcome to, um, you know, be here on. Yeah, he says, will there be a chat like this? Yes, there's still going to be the live stream chat. I have my setup right now. So I have two computers going. I have one through on Zoom and then one on YouTube. And so it's like two conversations at the same time. It's a little confusing, but it'll work. Uh, let's see, let me scroll down. Yes, so where was that? L. El Boss says, I sent an email about book club, haven't heard back yet. Yeah, I realized that I, I just hadn't thought about how am I going to coordinate all of these other people and how am I going to do this? So my fault, it will be figured out within like the next few weeks. And then I will be emailing you guys. I think Lucy and I are probably going to talk about it tomorrow. Um, and I'll figure out some sort of plan, like the logistics of trying to coordinate all of this. Cause I don't know. I just, of course, like, of course, of course it's so much easier when it's just me and Lucy, <laughs> like it's just the two of us. Like, I don't know why I didn't think that it was going to be, you know, exponentially more difficult when there's that many more people. So uh, Kevin says, when is, okay, is the book club weekly or monthly? The book club is normally the last Thursday of every month. We're kind of doubling up on books because we got, I got way behind with everything. So we're doing an extra book club thing this month in order to try to, to try to kind of get us back on schedule. That's why there's been two this month. So, and just so you know, so how it would work with Zoom is if you, if you guys wanted to do the book club, so I would put together a, like a, like a, a webinar is what it's called. <clears throat> and there's a link to it. And I would need to get everybody's, if you email me, then I'll have your email address. So I, I'll need to create like a group email and then email everybody the link to the webinar, which will say, this is, this is the link to the book club. Uh, click this link. And normally I have people log in like 15 minutes or so at a time. So you'll, you would get there like 15 minutes or so early. And then we would make sure that everybody's on, that everybody that, you know, if they're, if they want their camera off, their cameras off, those kinds of things. And then, um, would kind of run through how Zoom works because it's like what we would be doing through Zoom would, would be different than what 
a little different than what people would be seeing on YouTube. So it not that part's not that difficult. It's just more of like the logistics of like getting everybody to meet and have they all read the book and getting people questions and all of that that I need to kind of streamline. So yeah, we we would meet earlier that you know, 15 minutes or probably more than that the first time, meet a little earlier. Anybody that had any questions for me or if they were concerned about privacy, we would figure that out and then uh, we would go live. So, yeah. Yep, my research says, yep, two monitors to one computer. Yes. Huh. Uh, Banasby says, Dana, I requested to join the support group. I made a fake Facebook account. I messaged you there as well, but I'm not quite sure I have been accepted or seen there. How can I join it? Can you send me an email? Uh, because I don't know. I don't know what's going on. And I get a lot of messages but none that was about that. So I'm, I don't know what's going on. Dear Dana at thriveafterabuse.com. And we'll get you in. Okay, let's see. Uh, Joanna says, can you explain about a lesbian narcissist who went to a man after nine years with a woman? Well, a lot of times, narcissists in general, they're not really attracted to people, they're attracted to supply. So, and many of them are, I don't even know if you would even say bisexual. I'm not even sure if they really, they're just kind of sexually like when whatever's convenient, like whatever they need to be, they are true social chameleons. It's kind of whatever they need to be in order to get whatever they want. So if they're after money, if they're after social status, if they're after public image, if they're after, you know, kind of what have you, then, you know, it's very common for them to kind of morph into that. So, you know, not uncommon that they would go from even, or maybe the opposite, like being, being married to a man and then um, going after, you know, having a relationship with a woman and then by, you know, and then going back to a man and then, you know, who knows, it's just kind of whatever they, they, they become whoever they need to become in order to get whatever that they want to get. Let's see. Uh, Maria says, is there a place that lists up all upcoming books? Great question. Yes, there is. So if you go to my website, Thrive After Abuse, and I'm going to go there right now as well. Mm, this computer is so slow. There's a tab called Book Club. Why is my computer so slow? And let's see. Yeah, it's so it's thriveafterabuse.com slash book club, all one word. And it's the list of all the books that we're going to be reading for all of 2017. So if you want to order them from like your library or what have you, you can work on getting those sooner than later. And then, you know, too, if you have suggestions, we can keep adding to the list. Uh, 
Let's see, Stacy. Uh, it sounds like you're okay. There's a lot here. Katie says, I also sent you e an email that was not answered. Did you send it to, to dear Dana at thriveafterabuse.com? I've had, I've had ongoing email issues. So uh, okay. Let's see. Stacy saying, okay, this guy was in jail and they bailed him out of jail and she's not sure. It sounds like if it's, she's not sure if it's, he's, being going through her phone and doing all kinds of stuff. And he says it's because he's protecting her. Um, I don't know. St Stacy. Yeah, this sounds very, very um, problematic to me. I, I would strongly encourage you if you don't have a therapist, uh, at a minimum, like, like to consider that, or maybe even to consider joining the support group and going into more detail there. And I would ask yourself, you know, have you had other people in your life that have felt, you know, needed to protect you? Like, what do your friends say about this? Like, what do other people say about this? And I guess too, at the, end, at the end of the day, if he's in jail, then if he was in jail, then he was doing some pretty outrageous stuff. So to me, that would be a, a sign that that's a problem. Like that's a problem. Okay, gosh, I'm missing a lot of what's going on here with Stacy, and it sounds. Hmm. Stacy says, I have, okay, so it sounds like she made some sort of statement, but he, he's going to, it's not going to go over well. She says, I have to retract it. My dog and I moved back in with him. And Sada says, is he protecting you or not letting you be an adult? And she says, I have no choice. I don't, I don't you know, like I said, I'm, I think I'm missing a lot of what happened here and what's going on at the chat, but it sounds really problematic to me and I, it sounds like it's sounding problematic to most people that are on tonight. So I, I would encourage you to get into a support group and, and go into some depth there and, uh, and get some more feedback. You know, there, there are things that you can do if this person's not safe, if this environment is not safe, then even though you moved back in with them, you might need to move out and you might need to go into stay with a friend or a family or at a domestic violence shelter or, or something. But if this guy is making you feel like you're crazy and you're the problem and he's going through all your stuff and he's going to jail and all of this, you know, it's the stuff doesn't get better. And
Wow. Dragana says, here's an update. My ex moved to my neighborhood, threatening me and my stuff. The law changed in Serbia. So stalking is now a criminal offense. I reported him and he's now among the first five people to be arrested. That's awesome. I remember you going through that and being exhausted and terrified for quite a while. I'm really glad that that uh, ended well for you. And Dragana says, Stacy, there's always a choice, always. Yeah. Even if it feels like you're stuck, even if you don't see a way out now, even, even if you don't have all the answers, you do still have choices, even if it doesn't feel like it. It can help to sit down and try to brainstorm, like, what are some options? Even if they're not necessarily ideal, like, what are some options? You know, where could you go? If push came to shove, you know, could you go stay with friends or family? Could you go stay at a shelter? Could you go, um, you know, do you have a credit card? Do you have money? Like what, you know, like what, what can you do? Stacey says, my friends hate him. Yeah. Okay. Are you open, Stacy, to getting into a support group? If you are, I would encourage you to create a fake Facebook account with a fake name, don't befriend any of the same friends that you currently have on Facebook, if you are on Facebook, and join some support groups that way under that fake name. And Dana says, yes, uh, try and have a safety plan. Um, we can't make decisions for you, but if you have friends or can find resource resources in your community, it can help. Yes, good advice. I like that. Yeah, support groups can be really helpful. Having a, a safety plan can be helpful. Uh, kind of a, just a plan on if you were to leave, how would you do it kind of a thing. Uh, Joanna says, my breakup was something I never thought would happen. I didn't want my relationship to end. How did you get past the first three months? I'm always feeling lost or how do I get past this part? Yeah, the first, for sure, like th three weeks, three months, that initial time frame is the roughest. Staying busy helps a lot. And so I, what I did is I just continually told myself, like, the best revenge is a good life. That's what I kept telling myself over and over again. The best revenge is a good life. So any little, any little thing that I could do to make, to bring that good life into being is what I poured my energy into. If that was like going to the gym or going for a walk or going for a run or organizing a junk drawer or, um, you know, going, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of friends at that time because I was, I'd gotten divorced and all of our friends, my ex-husband was military and all of our friends were military and they'd all moved. So I really didn't even know anybody. It was awful, awful. Um, but the people I did know, like, you know, making an effort to go out and have drinks with people or to have lunch or, um, uh, you know, I started making jewelry around that time. Uh, just meetup.com. I am I, this. I lived in like rural New Mexico at the time when I was going through all my stuff. And so there was really nothing out there. And this was, you know, a while ago. So meetup.com is fantastic. You can really, you can really immerse yourself in anything that remotely interests you and, um, you know, you can meet new people, you can stay really busy. It's, it, 
just, I think, fantastic in many different ways. That's what I would highly recommend. And then, excuse me, and then to realizing that this feeling lost and this feeling like a bomb has gone off in your life, it's normal to feel this way and that this feeling won't always be there. This feeling will go away a lot quicker if you can get busy filling that void that this person left. But it's okay. It's okay. I mean, it's normal. It's normal to feel like you've had a bomb go off in your life because in many ways you have. So I think a big part of of it too is being good to yourself, tripling up on self-care. You know, now I, I tell people, it's like taking care of yourself, treating it like you have the emotional flu. You know, when you have the physical flu, you give yourself permission to lounge around and to stay in bed and watch movies and to eat tomato soup and to just kind of hunker down and take care of yourself. It's very much the same. It's kind of hunkering down and, and taking care of yourself with the emotional flu and, you know, getting movies and, you know, painting your nails or, you know, making some art or making some music or gardening or, you know, whatever kind of you find that would be taking a hot bath, whatever is, whatever would be self-care for you, now is the time to do that. And to just, I guess, just be gentle to yourself. Like you've been through a lot. You've been through a lot. And it's, you know, it, it hurts and it's going to hurt for a little bit. But it, every day, here's something else too. Every day you're healing a little bit. Don't ever lose sight of that. Every single day you're healing a little bit, even if you don't see it. It's sort of like if a person breaks their leg and at first there's all of that pain and your leg is swollen and the, you know, it's, it, it's just, it's red and it's, it's hot to the touch and you can't put any weight on it. And, you know, and then you get the cast on and, you know, then like, even though you might not see it healing every single day, you know, you're getting like one or 2% better. Like it's still healing, even though you don't see that it's healing. It is. And that's, so just realize that even if you're like, I'm not, I'm still feeling the same way. I'm not getting anywhere. Your body's working overtime to heal you like emotionally and physically. It really, really is. And just kind of having to, a lot of it is just giving it time, being extra good to yourself and um, kind of putting the pieces of all of the puzzle together will happen in time. Like you're not going to have all the answers all at once. And frankly, that's probably a good thing because it's, it's just, it's a lot, but you're not alone in this. And, uh, you know, just be good to yourself. You can get through this. You can, not only can you get through this, you can come out on the other side of this and have an even better life than you did before. I know that sounds wild, but it's true. You really, really can. There's lots of people out there that have come out on the other side of this and they're like, oh my goodness, I have learned the personal growth that's come from this is tremendous. But it that personal growth tends to happen after the shock and the of the trauma has kind of settled down. So follow what gives you peace right now. You know, like I said, figuring all of this out, putting together all of the pieces, that'll come in time. Right now, it's most important that you're just extra good to yourself. And Michael says, trust me, after three months of no contact, it gets so much better. I made the unfortunate mistake of going back once more. Never again, though. Good for you. Good for you. 
And Lou says, yeah, I'm going to work hard to become a brand new man. Yeah, you know, there is a term out there called, uh, well, we're all familiar with PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. There's another term called PTG, and it stands for post-traumatic growth. And it only happens from trauma. So it's when a person, these traumas happen, and after kind of the shock of this trauma wears off, it can, a person can really kind of go either way. You know, we can let these, these events like sink us, or we can let these events reveal us. And by reveal us, reveal like our highest and best self. I had given the example, I think last week about my brother who uh, is, who has terrible times with women and relationships and, and he's an awesome guy. Like, I just think the world of him, like he, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. Cause I guess it's cause I just think, you know, he's handsome. He's a fitness trainer. He's funny. He, I don't know. I just think he's the total package, but he, this was years ago. Um, he was working at Starbucks and um, you know, I, he really wanted to be a personal trainer. And a lot of people in my family were like, you know, no, you got to stay at Starbucks. Like they, it's, my brother also has fibromyalgia. So they were like, you know, Starbucks has insurance. You, you, you need insurance because you're always at the doctor. This is what's safe. Like, this is what you need to do. And being a personal trainer, it's unpredictable. And maybe what if you don't make money and it's too risky and there's no insurance? Don't do that. And everybody kept trying to talk him out of it. And it's the test is hard and you're never going to make it and all these things. And he was in this relationship with this gal that he really liked. And she was cheating on him and he found out about it. And he was devastated and angry. And that lit this fire under him. And he just decided, you know what? He just had all this anger, all this energy. And he's like, you know what? That's it. I'm going to take that test and I'm going to do this. So I think it was sort of one of those moments of like, I feel like my life is over anyhow. So I might as well just make the jump and, and, and go do this. He had, I felt like, I think he felt like he had nothing left to lose. And so he did. And he passed the test and he got a job and he began doing really well. And, you know, this fast forward, I don't know, 10 years or so, and he's doing really, really well for himself and he's phenomenal and he loves it. That would not have happened had she not have been cheating on him, had that relationship not fallen apart. So just because something is awful now doesn't mean that you can't use all of this, all of this anger and rage and hurt to just squeeze out everything you can and be like, this is rocket fuel. Like I'm going to use all of this, Like, don't waste it. Cause that there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of emotion and energy in anger and rage. I'm going to use this as rocket fuel to take me to the next level, whatever that next level is. Maybe I'm going to get really organized or maybe I'm going to sober up. Or maybe I'm going to get into like really great shape. Or maybe I'm going to go back to school and get that degree that I really want. You know, let, th let this fuel you to reveal like your highest and greatest self. Yeah. <laughs> Scott says, your muscles love rage. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you go to the gym and you just you know, you attack it. <laughs> like you just go beast on with weights or on the treadmill and get it out. It just is an awesome feeling. It's, and it's such a great feeling when you can do it in something positive because these, when these things happen to a person, it can really go either way. It can be like, okay, like I can go, you know, run this out at the gym or take a kickboxing class or, or what have you or I can start drinking or I can turn to drugs or I can, there's, 
lots of different ways to cope with these things. And I strongly encourage you guys to cope positively. You know, your future self will thank you for it. So. Uh, um, let's see. June says, I just took up kickboxing three weeks ago. Yeah. Good for you. I, at the time, this was like, Gosh, it was probably the same week that everything happened. I knew I'm like, I need to do something. And I had gotten a trainer at the gym and there was one, like, this is probably like our first or second session. And here I am like meeting with this guy, he's this young guy and he's asking me about my goals. And I just started crying and I'm telling him like, I just got, this is like my whole life just fell apart and I'm here because I don't know what else to do. And so I'm going to do sit-ups and I'm going to run on that treadmill. And he just looked at me like, this just happened. I'm like, yeah, like Thursday, <laughs> like, this, like this just, this just, just, just happened. Like my whole life just fell apart. Hi, <laughs> like it's 48 hours later, I'm here. I need to do something. And it was the gym. I had a, it was a 24 hour like fitness place and I was there often. And that, it was mainly because I just, it was great because I could be there and, I didn't have to go home and have time to think like I could put on some music and I could just run it out. It was very, very helpful. But I think too, keeping perspective, realizing, you know, that many of your best days are still ahead of you. This is not the end all be all final blow of, of it, of your life. You know, that this is, this is an event you, know, you can move, you can, and you will be moving forward from this. And the pain is not always going to be this intense. You just keep moving forward in the direction that gives you peace. Keep moving in that direction. Yeah. Scott says, wow, Dana, good for you in just two days. Yeah. I, a lot of it came from my brother. And I had called him sobbing and I was like, what's wrong with me? Like, why am, what's like, why doesn't anybody, like, why am I so unlovable? And I was just a wreck, you know? And he was telling me he had, in the, at that, it was that time that he told me his whole story with this girl and cheating and how he became a trainer. And he was the one that was like, Dana, you have this, this window of opportunity you've got all of this energy in you, all of this rage and sadness and intensity. He's like, don't waste this. Like use this, like use this for your highest and greatest good. And, you know, like I did, a, I had a lot of like really positive changes. I poured that energy into a lot of positive things back then. So it's, you know, it's huge. Yeah. Missouri Cowboy says post-traumatic growth is real. I do not wish trauma on anyone. This phenomenon is so astounding and some survivors of severe abuse that have moved forward capable of doing so much more than before. Yep. And you know, sometimes too, that post-traumatic growth, it's not just so like my brother's case, it was that one thing, right? Like he became, he radically changed his life and became a personal trainer and began like really just living his ideal life. It can also happen in small ways. You know, it can be facing your fears. It can be, it's, it's you marching in that direction of this is what's positive. This is what is healthy and what I want in my life. It's every decision that you come to, every fork in the road where you're like, you know, 
when you're letting your highest and best self surface, it's those victories. So Kevin, like what you were saying with Kevin was saying, I really wish I had some post-traumatic growth in my life, but dude, you do because you've been going to the, you've been facing your fear. You're like, okay, I'm terrified of going to the dentist. I'm going to go. And this is the plan that I'm doing it. Like you're incrementally moving in that direction of, you know, old Kevin, Kevin a year ago wouldn't have gone. Right. He would have continued to wait and wait and wait until things got really bad. But now you're like, okay, no, I'm going to deal with this. Here's my plan to deal with this. I'm moving forward. I'm marching forward and doing what I know I need to do. So, you know, that's, that's a victory that is moving forward and growing and, you know, you're, you're dealing with stuff head on. That's awesome. Uh, lots of people are saying, yeah, post-traumatic growth is so real. Yeah, it really is. You know, it's powerful stuff. So let's see. Hey, Dora says, hey, Dana, uh, I have had boundaries throughout my life for my relationships, my work, my family. I don't know why I let my guard down this last time. You know, my guess is narcissists, they target supply and then they manipulate vulnerabilities. We're all, we all have vulnerabilities as part of being human. And so if you find yourself with a narcissist in your life, it's a good idea to examine where, how did they get in? So it's, I did a couple of videos on this. There's one that says something like, do you want to know how or why you're dating a narcissist? I also did a video series on um, red flags of codependency, not saying that anybody is, is codependent, but that was the term that most people were looking for. That's why I used it. But anyways, it has to do with boundaries and deal breakers. And I think that video is in that playlist of why we tend to, like, the vulnerabilities that most of us have that they tend to exploit. A lot of us, if you experience a lot of the love bombing where he was coming on pretty strong, um, that's generally a, a pretty clear sign that a person's been feeling like unloved or unimportant. And when you're experiencing that love bombing, it can just feel like warm maple syrup on the pancakes of your soul. Like it just feels so good. So if that's, if that's how they got in, then that's worth examining. Um, you know, there's, and there's, that's just one example of different, some of the vulnerabilities that are going on. So, oh, uh, Mantis, you're fine. He says, I'm sorry to have crossed lines. You're, you're totally fine. I didn't think anything of it. I just, uh, wasn't going to read the comment on the air because it sounds very, I feel very arrogant. <laughs> if, I, if I read people, if people compliment me, it feels really, it feels like double weird reading it on out loud <laughs> and then having it on video. But so, but thank you. I, I yeah, no worries. Uh, Dora says, yeah, texted me 30 times a day. I was flattered. I was so dumb. It was love bombing. Okay. Hindsight's always 20-20. You're not dumb. 
there's lots of people. I, I have spoken with doctors, attorneys, judges, police, therapists, you name it, who have gotten roped in with love bombing. It has nothing to do with intelligence or education or even familiarity with the topic. So it's when we have a vulnerability, we are truly, it's a blind spot and it's, we're not aware of it. So when a person comes on like that, then, you know, it's, it's just, it's generally that sign of, okay, we're feeling lonely is the vulnerability that's being exploited. And so now once you know, okay, is it, was I feeling lonely? Was I feeling, did this person make me feel like loved and important? Was that kind of it? Once you're aware of that vulnerability, then you can get to working on it to where it's not a vulnerability. Then you, you know, again, meetup.com, fantastic for this, where you're kind of filling that void and you're, uh, you know, getting engaged in all kinds of different activities and you're meeting new people, those kinds of things. So that, you know, when you, when we've got a narcissist in our life, it's, it can be very telling. There's a lot that can be kind of learned from those relationships or friendships. A lot of personal growth, hard one personal growth, but personal growth all the same that can come from that. I mean, I was teaching classes at a domestic violence shelter on red flags of abusive behavior, what to watch out for. And I got sucked in two big times I mean, those are the guys I do my videos about, but you know, there's been like a handful of times where I've been sucked in for like a month or two and then I saw it clearly and then got out. And I was so hard on myself. I'm like, man, if anybody should know, it should be me. And what's, what's wrong? Like what's going on? So, you know, once, once you see, so for, for me, from what I realized what was going wrong is I was only teaching, I was only aware of like the overt problematic behavior, like how to warn people about the wolves and wolves clothing. I was, my radar was not even set to scan for Prince Charming as being a problem. And then once I realized that it was just like this wave of horror washed over me and it was the realization of, oh my God, I've only been teaching like, half the red flags, what else, what else is out there that I'm missing? And then that kind of became the focus of my life really. And I poured myself into all this and several hundred videos later, here we are. So you don't be so hard on yourself, you know? Dora says, yeah, the flattery became crazy. I knew something didn't seem right, but I allowed it. Yeah. It's hard to walk away when we're getting a need met. Even if we know something's off. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same thing. People that got caught up with Bernie Madoff or that get involved in cults. You know, nobody ever thinks that they're joining a cult. Nobody ever thinks that they're getting involved in a financial scam. Hindsight's always 2020. And you know, people that got involved with Bernie Madoff. It was like, wow, this really seems fantastic. This guy's so likable and you know, everything kind of seems to line up and everybody else seems to like him. And then they start noticing, oh, that's really kind of off. Ooh, this doesn't line up. And mm, the guy said he was going to send the check and he didn't send the check. And things, people are like, man, my gut's telling me there's something off, but I really want to hold on to hope that, he's just having issues with his personal life or what have you. And then I'm, that I'm going to get my money back or the same with the cult, you know, what starts off is boy, this new religion is so fantastic. And these people are just really my kind of people. And it's so nice to have the sense of family and the sense of community. And then all of a sudden things start to get kind of weird. And, you know, now they're wanting you to give them all their money. And now they're wanting you to move into this compound. And now we are having to, dress a certain way and things start to get like, oh, that's kind of weird. But it's like, boy, it's sure, but it's really nice to be around all these people that really understand me. 
And then things start to get weirder and weirder and their boundaries start to get pushed and pushed. It's how any problematic situation happens. It's always happened slowly. If it happened, obviously, right? If it was like one day, you know, you've got this cult leader that says, okay, now everybody's going to shave their head and we're all going to wear purple and we're only going to, you know, drink orange juice and eat donuts seven days a week. People would be like, what? That's nuts. Like we're out of here. Problematic stuff doesn't happen that obviously it's kind of a slow descent over time and abusive relationships are very much the same way. And it's hard. It's so hard. I get that. I, mean, I was there too. It's so hard to walk away. Cause you're like, I can't tell if this person's problematic or if I'm making too big of a deal out of things. Like this doesn't sit right. This seems too good to be true, but what if it's not like, what if it's just really like awesome? What if it's just too good? And I have issues with men or with commitment or, you know, self-esteem. And I just have issues with being loved. Like maybe that's what's going on. And we can really start working our, it's that confusion working ourselves up into all of this confusion, trying to figure out, is it them? Is it me? Like, what's going on? Why does this feel off? Especially if everybody around you is like, oh, you're so lucky to have a person in your life like this. Oh my goodness, your boyfriend, he texts you 30 times a day and he, you know, is telling you everything that you want to hear. And he's so romantic and attentive and perfect. If they don't see a problem, then it makes us second guess ourselves. And that's a big learning lesson in this too, is really learning to pay attention to your gut instinct. That even if you're in a room full of people that are like, oh no, no, there's no problem here. But you're like, you know, I think there is. And something's off and I gotta go. That you get to the place where you're okay with going with your gut instinct and risking, maybe you're wrong, maybe there's no problem there, but you're not going to risk it because your gut's telling you that something's off, that you'd rather go with that and, and be able to assert yourself in a room full of even family and friends than to go with the flow and to think that, well, maybe everybody else is right and that you're wrong. So, okay, Stacy. Stacy says, thank you all again. I really appreciate it. Please take care. And Stacy, I hope to see you. Uh, hope to see you around. If not, we'll be back on tomorrow for the book club. But we're here every single Wednesday night, eight thirty p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to come back, so take care. Okay. So we should probably wrap it up a little bit, for it is getting late. So let's do a brief meditation like we did last time where we just take a minute or two and we just sit in silence and just kind of visualize just healing energy. Visualize just a ball of energy inside of you, like white glowing light. It's pouring out into the world and then it's coming back to you, okay? So let's just close our eyes and just, just send healing energy out. To other people and to ourselves. A deep breath in. And exhale. And another deep breath in. And exhale. 
exhale. Just sending that healing energy out into the world and to each other. Just realizing that you matter. And that you're gonna get through this. that you're gonna use this for your highest and greatest good. And that you're not gonna let this ruin your life. That you're gonna take all of the strength and personal growth and wisdom and courage and use this to let it reveal your highest and best self. You are strong and you are capable and you can do this. <laughs> okay, and for those of you that have your eyes closed, if you wanna open your eyes and come back, And we're gonna, let's see, let me scroll up here. Oh my goodness, Doug. I was, I keep meaning to mention you every single live stream. I am, oh, he says, thank you, Dana. I am healed and your video saved me years of pain and suffering. Wish me luck to thrive after healing. I still listen and appreciate all of you in chat. Love and light to all. Namaste. And thank you for a really generous donation, Doug. That is completely, I don't even know what to say to that. Thank you so much. And um, lots of light and love to you. We definitely miss having you around, but we know that there's been stuff going on, so... So it's good to see, good, I'm so thrilled to know that you're still around and that you're listening and that you're here, that you're here. So we're gonna call it a night. We'll see you guys uh, tomorrow for book club, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then if you're not into that, we have the, live stream again next week, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And you can email me your questions. If you have any, dear Dana at thriveafterabuse.com. I'm gonna call it a night. So just as always, lots of love to you guys. You are not alone, you are not crazy, and you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, bye.